Thank you very much and good morning everyone and welcome to this meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council's Planning Committee. My name is Councillor Henry Batchelor. I'm the usual Vice Chair of this committee, but given the regular Chair, chair Councillor Pippa Halings has sent her apologies today, I'll be chairing the meeting for today. Uh, just a few bits of housekeeping before we go into the, uh, the main body of the meeting, please. Um, and I will start by, obviously, given that I'm the vice chair, sitting in the chair, we do need to appoint a vice chair for this meeting. So I'd like to appoint Councillor Fain, if he's still open to that. Um, can I get members' agreement that Councillor Fain sits as vice chair? Uh, Councillor Fain, congratulations. Please do come join me. <laughs> so whilst Councillor Fain's getting set up, um, I said I'll run through a few housekeeping um, announcements, please. So can everyone in the council chamber please note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point. The camera follows the microphone after it's switched on, so councillors and officers are requested to wait a few seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. If the fire alarm sounds, please do leave the chamber and make your way down the staircase. Do not use the elevator. The safe assembly point is next to the marketing suite, halfway down the business park. Could those participating in the meeting via the live stream please indicate you wish to speak via the chat column? Please do not use the chat column for any other purposes other than requesting to speak. Please make sure your device is fully charged and that you switch your microphone and camera off unless you're invited to do so otherwise. Please ensure you switched off or silenced any other devices you have so they do not interrupt proceedings. Uh, when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. When you've finished addressing the meeting, please turn your microphone off immediately. Members in the room, please note if we need to vote on any item, we should do so via the microphones in front of us. Only those members present in the chamber today will be able to vote. Uh, committee members, we're now going to take a roll call. So after I've called your name, could you switch on your microphone and introduce yourselves, please? So as I said earlier, my name is Councillor Henry Batchelor. I'm one of the members for the Linton Ward, and I am the usual vice chair of this committee. Can I ask Councillor Peter Fain to introduce as well? Good morning, Peter Fain, councillor for Shelford Ward. Thank you, councillor Dr. Martin Kahn. <laughs> councillor Martin Kahn, uh, uh, member for Histon in Peter and Orchard Park. Thank you, councillor Dr. Claire Daunton. Yes, hello, good morning, Claire Daunton, um, one of the members for the Fendit and, and Fullbourne Ward, substituting for councillor Halings this morning. Good morning, councillor Sue Ellington. Councillor Sue Ellington, I'm substituting for um, Councillor Richard Williams, and I'm normally District Councillor for Swavesley Ward. Thank you. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Je yeah, Councillor Jeff Harvey. I'm the member for Borsham Ward. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Timmy Hawkins, member for Caldicott Ward. Thank you. Councillor Judith Ripeth. Good morning. I'm Councillor Judith Ripeth, member for Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Thank you. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Good morning, Chairman. Uh, good morning, everybody. Deborah Roberts. I'm the District Councillor for the Foxton Ward. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Morning, all. Heather Williams, and I represent the Mordens Ward. Thank you. And last but not least, Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, Eileen Wilson, um, Councillor for Cottenham Ward. Thank you. So I can confirm we have a full slate. So we are quorate, eight, so the meeting can proceed. Um, I will now do some introductions for the officers we have uh, with us today who are supporting the committee, starting with our joint director. No, sorry. No, Nigel, no, no, Nigel Blaisby, I almost gave you a promotion there, but Nigel, if you could introduce yourself. Oh, thank you, Chair, for that. <laughs> um, yes, uh, Nigel Blaisby, Delivery Manager for Development Management. Morning. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Stephen Reid. Stephen? Morning, Chair. Morning, members. Um, oh, chair. Morning. Thank chair. you. Morning. And Michael Sexton, please. Good morning, Chair. Yeah, Michael Sexton and all three items are mine, so it's nice to be with you in person this morning. Good. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you for being with us in person. Um, and we also have clerking the meeting today, who's joining us virtually, Mr. Lawrence Damari Homan. Lawrence. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to all our public speakers as well. Looks like a, a busy meeting ahead of us, but as you say, Lawrence Damari Homan. Democratic Services Officer. Thank you very much. So those are several that we have in the chamber with us. Um, members, just a reminder, if you do need to leave the meeting at any point, please do indicate so that can be recorded in the minutes. 
Uh, we'll be taking regular breaks, uh, dependent on where we are in the agenda, but if you do need a break sooner, then please do indicate, and I'll try to accommodate. Uh, okay, members, I think with that, oh, sorry, one more announcement I do want to make. Um, I'm not sure if she's online or not, but some of you may know that uh, Julie Eyre is actually leaving us in a, in a, I think, this week or next week. So if she needs to take part at all, this will be her last ever planning committee meeting. She's been at South Cams for, I think, 17 years and is a, you know, a very long-standing, well-respected member of the planning department, not only amongst officers and members, but also I know parishes as well and residents of South Cambridgeshire. So without trying to embarrass her too much, it's just to say a thank you from, from the committee. Uh, Julie, I know other members and officers have spoken to you directly, but just if we could just record our thanks for Julie for all her service over the years and for supporting this committee so ably during that time. So thank you very much to Julie. Great. Okay, well with that we'll move on to apologies please, Lawrence. Yes, so we've received apologies from absence from the usual chair, Councillor Pippa Halings. Uh, Councillor Dr Claire Daunton has kindly substituted on her behalf and Councillor Dr Richard Williams has also sent apologies with Councillor Sue Ellington substituting. Thank you. Item three members, declarations of interest. Do any members have any interests to declare? Uh, non disposable disclosed pecuniary or non pecuniary items, please. Councillor Hawkins and then Harvey. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, just to say, I am the uh, local member for Caldicott and have been at the meetings where the item number. The first one. <laughs> Five, Thank you. <laughs> um, has been discussed. I did not take part in, or oh, I did not take part in the vote, but I was at the discussion. But I'm coming to this matter afresh. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Um, though I'm the member for Borsham Ward, um, I actually live in um, Greater Abington, um, and so I, I have had some informal discussions um, on the. Um, Bancroft Farm item on the agenda, so um, I, but I will come to the matter afresh. Thank you, and one from me as well, uh, non-disclosable interest on item six, Little Abington. As the local member for Little Abington, I've obviously been at parish council meetings when this application has been discussed, but um, I'm coming to this matter afresh, so I'm able to take part. And Councillor Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's in the appeal section, um, I'm the local member for some of the cases that are stated and obviously have had discussions with, with officers around those. So that's item nine. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Any more interest to declare, members? Councillor Wilson? As always, on the, um, the report, the enforcement report, I'm the local member for Cotton and I've had discussions with officers about Smithy Fairness. Okay, that's noted. Thank you very much. Okay. Councillor Khan, are you waving? Um, I was just going to comment that I think in quite a lot of people here may have been involved in the previous application on Ban uh, Ban uh, Bancroft Farm, but we're all going to, I think we should all be saying that we're coming to the matter afresh. Yes, indeed, this is a new application, so obviously we're coming to it afresh, regardless of what's happened before. Thank you. Chair. Councillor um, Thornton. Yes, thank you. Um, in relation to uh, the final item, a uh, land east of Tevisham Road, Fullbourne, I'm one of the members of Fullbourne, and that's reported on. That. Okay, thank you very much. You can pop your mic off. You can switch your mic off, please. Thank you. Okay, with that, members, we'll move to item four on the agenda. That's minutes of the previous meeting. These were circulated to us electronically yesterday, and I know a few of us have got paper copies. Uh, so do any members have any, uh, any issues with the minutes, any... Uh, corrections. No. Okay. So we'll take those as agreed and I'll sign those at the end of the meeting as a correct record. Okay. We move into the main, um, main items of business on the agenda today, members, beginning with agenda item five, which is an application at the land east of Highfields Road, Caldercott. The application in front of us is a full application for the construction of 74 dwellings with associated infrastructure, open space and landscaping. The, the applicant sorry, is uh, Linden's LLP. We have a raft of key material considerations in our papers. And the reason it is coming to us today because it's a significant departure from the development plan. It's a major residential development outside of the framework boundary. 
and the officer recommendation is in contradiction to that of the parish council. Uh, the officer recommendation is approval. The presenting officer, who's going to be quite busy today, I think, is Mr. Michael Sexton, who's in the room with us. Uh, Michael, so I'll hand over to you if there's any updates to the report and to introduce the item, please. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. Good morning, everyone. Um, just a, one update to the recommendation on paragraph 340 of your report. Um, I was in correspondence with the agent yesterday um, who would just like to refine some of the wording on conditions E, F, G, T, W, B, B, and C. Um, the substance of the conditions isn't being lost. It's just refining, for example, condition BB, which secures an ecological report that's been submitted. It's just refining the wording to, for clarity to reference particular sections of that report. So if members were minded to support the application, I would perhaps ask that we could tweak the recommendation um, to include final wording of conditions to be agreed with chair and vice chair, rather than running through eight slight revisions today. Um, and just also to make members aware that we do have Harry Pickford from the Lead Local Flood Authority on the call this morning. Um, drainage has been a sensitive issue on this site for many years, so Harry is here to support and answer any technical questions that may arise on drainage. Um, that's it for updates. So I will share my screen. Um, please bear with me. I'm used to having multiple screens at home. Excellent. And I don't need to ask if you can see that, Chair, because I can see it myself. So, thank you. This is, yes, a full planning application um, for the construction of 74 dwellings together with associated works, uh, land east of Highfield to, uh, Highfield to Caldicott. Um, this is the site outlined in red and to the east side of Highfields Road. Um, the reason you've got the blue line is because there's relevant planning history. Um, in 2015, there was an outline application um, for all of this area. Um, and this part, uh, sort of small section of land here, which was allowed at appeal in July 2017 for the construction of up to 140 dwellings. Uh, there was a 2018 reserve matters application that was approved in November 2019, which granted permission for 66 dwellings in the northern parcel of the site. And that image there is the approved master plan um, that was granted and that's currently under construction. Um, the areas in the blue uh, were to be phase two. Um, unfortunately, the reserve matters application didn't come forward within the time permitted within the outline consent, and therefore members have today in front of them a full planning application for 74 dwellings, which would in effect have been a second reserve matters application. But it's not, it's a full application, so it's assessed um, in full, but weight can be given to the planning history. For context, this is a view, um, the site is, is tucked in here. This is the roundabout of Highfields Road and Clare. Drive, um, properties on the western side of Highfields Road, Caldicott, typically range from single storey, one and a half storey with the occasional two storey property. And the bottom image is just a view down Clare Drive where you can see again single storey properties and one and a half storey and sort of two storey properties. Again, just a view uh, of some property, typical properties on the west of Highfields Road um, opposite the site. And then the bottom uh, image just shows the northern parcel that's currently under construction um, by Minden Homes. So this is the proposed site plan for the erection of 74 dwellings. Um, it has the green uh, wedge coming through the centre of the site that was part of the previous scheme, and that's been incorporated into the layout of the application site before you. Um, there's a provision of 30 affordable dwellings within the layout, which is 40% um, as required by national po uh, our policies. And it's very much a sort of continuation of the northern phase, as you'd expect. Um, just a few housing examples, there's, there's quite a few house types, so I'm not going to display them all, but this just gives you a sense. Um, typically, they're two-storey properties throughout the site in detached and semi-detached forms. As you can see from these examples. Um, a notable uh, construction to highlight is flat block C, which is a three-storey um, apartment building. It is reflective of a flat block that has already been consented as part of the phase one reserve matter scheme, which um, there's a slide later on just to illustrate that further. And these are some illustrative street scenes just to show the sort of variation in, in materials and house types and the predominantly two-story scale of development. But as you can see, there is the larger apartment block in the, uh, the central section there. 
And this is just uh, an illustrative landscape scheme to show how it connects in with phase one and the sort of softer edges along the eastern boundary um, and southern boundary of the site and a secondary sort of area of open space and soft landscaping in the centre of the site as well, um, connecting onto the big open space and the leap which is within phase one development. The key constraint and obviously main reason why this is before members today is that the site is located outside of the development framework boundary of Caldicol, which I've denoted with this dashed black line. Um, so the application site is this southern parcel here and phase one is the consented that's currently under construction. So you can see as set out in the report, the application site is bound on the southern, western and northern boundaries by residential development. So therefore the degree of encroachment, which is part of um, what policy S7 seeks to protect countryside, uh, encroachment of countryside is, is mitigated somewhat as set out in the report. Um, again, as noted in the report, Caldicott is a group village um, and in the council settlement hierarchy, it states that within frameworks, eight dwellings is typically the quantum of development accepted or 15 on the Brownfield site. So clearly 74 dwellings outside the framework is contrary to that policy. And again, why it's before members today. Um, but the material planning history, uh, the planning history that is relevant to material and the inspector in 2017 found 140 dwellings to represent the sustainable form of development, hence officer recommendation today. Caldicott has a village design guide, SPD, and there is uh, an element of the design of the scheme which is in conflict with the village design statement. That is guidance note 6.1, which sets out that development should be typically 1.5 or two storeys in height. So this comes back to the apartment building which I highlighted earlier. Um, the reference is marked by this yellow star here, um, which is it's almost identical to the uh, consented apartment building marked by the yellow star up there. So again, set into the site. Um, the orange star just represents sort of a two and a half, three storey apartment building as well within the consented scheme. So there's a range of, a large range of material considerations um, as set out in the report. The, the principle of development is contrary to the local plan, um, which is why we're here today. Officers are satisfied in terms of housing provision, market mix, affordable housing, etc., cetera, um, and that the character is, is responsive, landscaping is appropriate. There is a 10% net gain in biodiversity because of an offsite contribution that will be made towards the Lower Valley Farm project in Forborn. Um, and yes, yeah, so there's no technical objections to the other issues listed on there, so I won't go through them internally. They are set out in the report. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Michael. Um, yeah, if you could just keep your presentation open on your laptops, I'm sure it would be needed uh, during the debate to refer back to. Um, members, we're going to go to public speakers now. Um, we have a raft of them at the back of the room by the looks of things. Um, the first one we have is Miss Mary Ann Claridge, if she's with us. Good morning. Yep. So if you press the right hand button on the microphone, that switches it on and off. If you just switch it on to make sure it's working. Yep, we've, we've got you. Um, so I'm not sure if you've been to the planning committee before, but we offer all speakers three minutes to address uh, the committee, uh, after which if you could stay seated in case there's any questions committee members have for you. Um, to clarify any points you've made during your comments. So, yeah, if you could switch your mic on and whenever you're ready, please. Good morning. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the neighbours along the southern boundary. As the planning officer said in his report, this proposal is outside the development framework of the group village and it is against your local plan. Reading 74 houses as infill seems to me quite a long stretch. Mr. Claridge will detail how the proposal is also against the Caldicott VDS. The only argument for it is that it was once permitted against the criteria in the 2013 NPPF. Conditions have changed since then. You have a valid local plan, so the NPPF no longer trump trumps all arguments. The village has fewer services, the shops shut, and the access to public transport, which was a key factor in the public inquiry, has reduced with no buses through the village, the only bus stop is more than 800 metres away and is scheduled to be moved even further away. And our district councillor told a parish meeting that Caldicott is known to be a village that's hard to serve. Allowing this proposal to go ahead would set a precedent for development that is counter to your local plan, making it very hard for you to 
defend against other non-compliant proposals in the future. If you still believe this, could, this should go ahead, please pause it until the boundary treatment is sorted out, especially on the southern side of the site. While the plans say in general terms that the boundary landscape buffer is to be retained, the detailed specs don't. In one section, the area marked as buffer is also the main boundary road. The remaining area is to be cleared to allow the drainage ditch to be dug as close to the boundary as physically possible. They've only actually specified a strip a foot wide to replant a new hedge to replace the established hedging, which is not just bramble as shown, but elm, may, slow, elder, somehow all the various surveys even managed to miss a 30-foot tree. When I read the ecological appraisal and saw how important the boundary is for birds and bats, including protective barber stells for foraging and commuting, I hoped it might be retained. But all plans show clearers. We appear to be in a green area, but with the monocultures around us, we need established hedging such as this. Your own SP biodiversity SPD stresses the importance of keeping wildlife corridors and supporting protected species on site. Exporting our biodiversity to the other side of Cambridge will not help wildlife here. The boundary position is not clear. All the neighbours on the southern boundary have severe concerns that we will come back one day to find our hedge gone. All previous groundwork has appeared very enthusiastic in clearing any vegetation that isn't explicitly protected. We're concerned that if this is only decided by condition, as soon as permission is granted, it will be open season on ground clearance. The hedge will be cleared before any enforcement could be taken. Please refuse this. If you allow it, please set a minimum depth that must be kept uncleared. Thank you. Thank you. To the second. I appreciate your timing. Um, members, do you have any questions of clarification um, for Mrs. Claridge? Uh, Councillor Ellington, please. Thank you. I wonder if you could tell me when the design code was agreed. I'm afraid I can't give you the exact date. I believe it was January 2020. It was immediately after the phase one was given permission and before the, this submission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any further questions for our speaker? No, I can't see any. So just leaves me to say thank you very much for taking the time to actually come to us today. Um, and again, thank you very much. So members, we'll move on to our next speaker now, who is speaking on behalf of the applicants. Do we have a Mr. Andy Moffat? Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So you've probably heard um, the rules before. Three minutes to address the committee. And obviously, if you wouldn't mind staying seated at the end in case there are any questions of clarification for yourself. So whenever you're ready, please. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you for the opportunity to address you this morning. Um, we'd also like to thank the case officer for the comprehensive report Juva, you have in front of you. To assist your consideration this morning, we felt it'd be helpful to highlight four matters. Firstly, we welcome the conclusion that the presence of phase one means that the second phase is now considered a form of infill development. We also endorse the relevance of the previous decision on this site to set out in the report and the more recent appeal decisions that have been allowed for comparable developments on sites outside development frameworks in the district as also referenced in the report. Secondly, it is important to note that the benefits of development are greater now than in 2017. It will secure a 10% biodiversity net gain in advance of the implementation of the Environment Act 2021 through collaboration in the innovative County Council initiative at Lower Farm Fulbourne, which in itself will link to the Cambridge, Net, uh, Cambridge Nature Network, delivering habitat enhancement connected to its wider surroundings, facilitating wildlife movement across the landscape, enabling plant and animal populations to occupy sustainable ranges and adapting to a changing environment due to climate change and other pressures. Furthermore, whilst the requirement is that 5% accessible and adaptable homes are proposed, more than 70% of the affordable units, as well as 5% of the market homes, will be accessible and adaptable homes. And all dwellings will comply with national described uh, space standards. 
A greater quantum of planning obligations are also now proposed um, than previously secured. Proposed obligations now secure off-site contributions towards outdoor sports, additional allotment space slash delivery of Coldcott Peace Garden, indoor community space, indoor sports hall improvements, swimming pools, green infrastructure at Hardwick Wood, early years places and library facilities. Thirdly, the site is an allocation in the Council's local plan first proposals. The report states that no weight can be afforded to that allocation at this time. We would have to disagree. It is material. To quote the first proposals, it sets out our, i.e. the Council's, preferred approach to the level of growth that should be planned for and where it should be planned. At the end of last year, and as part of that very carefully considered plan, the Council itself identified this site as one of the sites it preferred to meet the identified need. Fourthly, and importantly, we do recognise that drainage is a key issue and concern within the village. As confirmed at paragraph 330 of the report, a meeting took place between council officers, the LLFA and local residents, and the LLFA's recommendation to raise no objections subject conditions is made with the benefit of a full understanding of those local concerns. Thank you. If you could wind up now, please. I'm just finishing, yes. All of this reinforces the conclusion set out in your officer's report that the proposal is sustainable development, and we therefore respectfully invite you to approve the application subject to the extensive conditions, which include drainage, landscaping, and boundary treatments, and the obligations outlined in the report. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Uh, speakers, members, we have Councillor Williams, then to Hawkins, then Roberts, please. Thank you. Through yourself, Chair, um, my questions are around um, some of the things that have been raised by, by local residents, um, particularly about the heights of the building being in contrast to the village design guide. I'm just wondering um, if there could be a reason given for why those heights have been taken other than financial benefits, obviously, because that's not material consideration. Um, and the other thing is about the um, landscape buffer that's referred to, but it's, it's not... Um, it's not really adequate. Just wondering if, if any uh, sort of uh, reasons, material reasons have been given for why those um, requests and guides have not been adhered to. Okay. Um, yeah, Mr Moffat, so two questions there, I think, some justification on the building heights and also the reduced landscape buffer. Yeah, but perhaps if I take the first one first, I think as the, the case officer referred as well, I mean, there's a predominance of two-storey units within the, the development. Um, there is one building, the, uh, the three-storey one that uh, the case officer showed you on the plan. There are two already in phase one. So I think what we're seeking to do, the, the design guide talks about sort of replicating the prevailing development, but having regards to that. So we've had regards to existing development in the, in the immediate locality. I think the other thing worth emphasising is the location of that building, well away from the sort of central within the development, away from the boundaries, so it will be seen in that context. So as I said, we, we've had regard to what is now part of the prevailing uh, character of the area. But as I said, just to finish, it is predominantly two-storey, and particularly two-storey around the uh, perimeter of the, uh, of the site. And the landscape buffer? And, and on the other one, I say, certainly I, mean, I think you, you saw a screen which shows the landscape in the green areas around the, uh, around the edges. Um, you know, there, are, there is a condition recommended which requires the precise agreement of those details, so we would expect to be uh, looking at those as part of that. But certainly the intention is both to retain the hedge insofar as it's beyond the boundary and uh, enhance that with further planting. Okay, thank you. I think Councillor Williams would like to come back. Thank you. Just, just to what you were saying there about, obviously, the, the buffer could change as, as things evolve and go forward. Um, you would then be in a situation that you would have to reduce something in order to create more space. So how, how would you f foresee that? Would you be reducing the number of housing to give you more landscape buffer or, or would it be a case of reducing um, gardens or private amenity space? How no, well, I, I didn't that? say change. I mean, what I said, you know, what the conditions will do is refine and clarify exactly what's going to happen on those boundaries in terms of the details, but that detail is shown on the plans. So I think we need to judge it on what we have in front of us now, today. Um, OK, thank you for that. Councillor Hawkins, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, 
Can I just check with you? Did you actually talk to the parish council um, or present this to them or consult with them before you brought this to, um, to the authority? I think there was extensively liaison as part of the phase one development. No. And as, as this did, you, did you or did you not consult with the parish council on this particular application? Not this, particular, not this particular issue. It carried forward the principles that we discussed with them on, on the, the original proposal. Okay. Um, so you didn't? This That's right, yes. On, phase, on this particular application, but as I said, okay. did just establishing carry that. forward those principles. Just establishing that. Um, also, I mean, the, the village design guide has been mentioned. Um, you seem to make very specific reference to the um, alleged three-story building, um, does that comply with the spirit of the village design guide regarding tall buildings? And whilst I'm at it, your two-story buildings are not two stories, are they? Not when you've got skylights in the roof of some of them. Look, Mr. Moffat? Well, I was going to say, well, I think the second bit was sort of statement. So in terms of the first part, that does it do with the spirit? I mean, very much the design guide is about and, um, reflecting what is characteristic of the, develop, of, the, you know, of the village. And I think what we're saying is in part, in small part, uh, the existing three-storey developments as part of phase two are now part of that character. So it is reflective of that. Okay. And the second part of my question? In terms of the two story, two -story buildings, correct. Yeah, yeah, again, I think the case officer showed you the plans there. So, in certain terms of the scale, um, you know, the eaves are all sort of two story eaves. So, so the, the scale of those developments are two story. As I said, um, you know, some of them do include accommodation within the, uh, the roof space. You saw, you saw that on the plans. But in terms of the scale and their impact on their surroundings, they are of two story scale. Can you tell me what the reach heights are for those two story buildings? I'm afraid I don't have that information. I think we can probably clarify that with the case yeah. officer during the Thank debate you. a bit later on. One more thing, if I may. Sure. Did you think to take this to the design enabling panel? Were you asked to? We, we certainly took the first, as I said, the, the first uh -huh. one. This one. This one. No, this, this one didn't. The first one did. And as I said, we've carried forward the principles okay. as Thank considered you. by the pre panel previously. Okay, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you, Chairman. And through you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, sir. Um, in your presentation, you made quite a lot of, um, as you saw it, benefits to the wildlife um, and your design of this. Now, looking at it, I can't see an awful lot of uh, green spaces being um, put on. It seems to be filled with um, would-be dwellings, and I say would-be, um, rather than that. So. You then explained that it would benefit the animals in the way that you've designed it so that they would be able to transfer um, and get through uh, in spite of the changing uh, uh, scenery of the place. Now, unless you're going to give all the birds and the animals sat-navs, um, can you tell me how it can be beneficial to animals, uh, what you see as uh, the design uh, values here that can be actually uh, beneficial to the creatures who presumably, often use an open green field. I'm not sure if you can answer that, but... Uh, if yeah, well, have so a, have I think there, there, are, there are two aspects of that. I mean, certainly, I think it's shown on the plan, there are networks, there are linkages, corridors for, for uh, um, you know, the wildlife through the development. But more particularly, um, in, ter in terms of ensuring that there's a 10% biodiversity net gain, there's a contribution towards the uh, uh, Lower Valley Farm Scheme at Fullbourne. So... I think when I went through those, that was in reference to the, that quite innovative initiative there and the benefits that that would deliver. So through the obligation um, that's being proposed, all of those would be delivered pr uh, partly off-site. But we have demonstrated through the uh, biodiversity metric that there is a measurable 10% uh, net biodiversity gain. Um, just quickly, Chairman, I, I presume that from what you've just said, um, there's going to be signage um, through um, your site for the animals? I, I don't think you need to answer that, Andy. 
Uh, okay, thank you for that. Councillor Ripeth, please. Good morning. Um, you mentioned the local plan first proposals in your um, presentation, but can I just get from you that that actually isn't relevant today. We are looking at this in the light of the current local plan. Well, what you, what you need to be doing is looking at this in relation to the development plan and any other material con planning considerations. And certainly it is our clear view that that is a uh, material planning consideration. So the Act requires you to look at both. Start with the development plan, but also take account of any other material planning considerations. And I'll get that plan confirmed is part if of you that. don't mind from the officer, but actually I, I see it as looking at what's the current local plan at the moment, and indeed that's kind of jumping the gun, but perhaps the officer could confirm. Sure, perhaps that might be, or do you want to confirm now, Michael, or we can wait till the debate? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I would go with, as set out in my report, that in my view, it's, it's not something you can attach weight to at this time. It was more there as a point of reference to highlight members. It is in there, uh, but it's an emerging document that, in our view, doesn't have any weight at this stage. Yeah, thank you very much. Emerging document, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jeff Harvey, please. Yes, thank you. And, and through you, Chair, um, you, you've made an uh, appeal um, both to the previous um, inspector's decision in 2017 and then, as we've just discussed, um, uh, cited the um, first proposals as, as supporting the case. But, um, you know, uh, so, so I suppose in a way um, you could sort of sit on your hands and wait for this to kind of um, be presented again um, when the new local plan comes into force. But uh, if you were to do that, um, you would then find um, substantially higher uh, energy um, targets in the new local plan um, if the consultation um, carries on in its um, current trajectory. Yes. Is there a question coming? Um, well, the question is really, um, should, and, and also um, we have uprated building regulations coming through this year. I'm just wondering if it's fair to um, sort of uh, recognising those two things, continue on with, um, you know, uh, building regs plus 10% energy target, um, g g given that you're making appeal to um, the future local plan, which would um, demand higher targets and whether you shouldn't be um, uh, kind of aiming a bit higher. And also, like, clarification, because I was a bit confused as to whether this is going to be using fossil fuels for heating or... Um, something like air source heat pumps. And I wonder if you could clarify that to the second point. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Moffat, if you picked up those two questions. Yes, yeah, so, so sorry for, I mean, I, I think you know, we're, we're looking back because we were talking about the relevance of the previous appeal decision. Um, and as part of that, um, the, the inspector at that time determined it was sustainable development. Um, well, I think we're also citing in support of our proposal the, the first proposals, but not relying on that. Um, for support, in our view, for the, uh, um, for the scheme. Um, I mean, in terms of the, the other aspects, you know, we did submit an energy statement as part of this application, as we have on phase one. We're looking at uh, PV. There is a condition recommended which ties us to the, uh, the, the various measures set out in that energy strategy. And, and as building uh, regulations um, develop o over time as well, we'll need to meet those as, as part of that as well. Does that answer your questions, Councillor? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, this, um, the, the first speaker um, mentioned the fact that there's um, a reduced amount of public transport um, coming to this site. So that, that's one concern that I have because, uh, as we know, things have moved on and there is more of a focus on active travel, cycling, walking, and for people not to be using their cars. So how would you um, suggest that the people who move into these um, dwellings um, reduce car use? Well, well I'll certainly imagine there is continuing sort of work on, on the sort of corridor here, on the sort of western corridor through um, 
through this sort of site and, and onwards sort of Camborne and beyond. So I think we'd look to link into into that. I mean, those those uh, measures are, are continuing. Those uh, uh, schemes are being explored further. Um, I mean, there are measures we can do within within the site um, in a, itself. Um, you know, we can have a travel plan which sort of seeks to promote some of those those measures as well. Um, there are measures, you know, like car clubs, things like that, that we could we could look at. So certainly, that's something that we could we could look at as part of a part of a scheme. Um, so, have you got those plans? No, I mean, those are the sorts of things that can be done by you know by condition. Uh, we put in a transport statement as part of this application, but those uh, measures could be, if members were so minded, secured by a, by a condition. Thank you. So I think that could be something we could ask for during the debate to be included should we vote to approve this. Uh, two more speakers, Councillor Ellington and then finally Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair, for you. Um, I just wondered what steps you are taking, given that Anglia Water say that there isn't capacity at the sewage plant to cope with this development, what steps you are taking to reduce the amount of outflow from the site? Are you thinking of grey water systems for all of the accommodation? Um, and what other steps are you taking? Or are you just saying, not us, Gov, it's somebody else's problem? Thank you. No, I mean, certainly in terms of both uh, surface water and foul water, there were sort of strategies submitted as part of the, the application um, and also, again, the, there's conditions which sort of set down the detail to ensure all of those measures are, uh, are actually uh, for, uh, sort of uh, finalised and, uh, and then implemented. So, so no, I mean, certainly we're, we're not. We're, you know, we're, we're put the strategy and the details um, will, be, uh, will be controlled. That's great. Thank you. Councillor Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for letting me come back, Chair, because I'd missed something off my list. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any response to the objection by the Definitive Maps Officer. Have you seen the objection from the Definitive Maps Officer? Well, certainly, I, where, I mean, there's, in, in terms of, the, I mean, there's a separate application, which I think has been referred to, if that's what you're referring to, in terms of sort of the, the Bridalway footway provision. So I think, you know, that will be uh, looked at as part of that application. Perhaps we might be able to get some clarity from Mr Sexton when we uh, come to the debate on that one. If you can make a note of that, Michael. And finally, Councillor Khan, please. Um, the, um, on Monday, the um, biodiversity planning guidance was adopted by the Cabinet and it's coming to, uh, coming to progress. Um, I'm glad to see the proposal to, uh, for off-site uh, compensation. I think this is a progress, a way that we should be going to forward. But I can understand the concern that it's rather far from the site in which we're looking at. Had you looked at other sites closer to the um, development uh, for compensatory? Uh, and did you, I, mean, I believe there's an SSSI, for instance, in just south of the court, called the court, which perhaps might have been uh, uh, amended or uh, added to. Maybe, have you looked at that as a possibility, or have you just gone to the one? No, no, no qu quite the contrary. In fact, we were sort of looking to seek into a local, perhaps the case officer will sort of reinforce this mm -hmm. as well. We spent a lot of discussions with your biodiversity or ecology officer on, on some of those options. Um, I mean, I think we're still fairly new um, as, as an industry in terms of the, the biodiversity net gain, the off-site provision. So what we wanted to do is provide with a scheme with, with, with certainty that it had been developed as a scheme, that we had a scheme, we knew exactly what it was going to deliver and we knew how it was going to deliver it. So we knew that the contribution would, would be effective. Um, but no, certainly we started the other way around. We started local and those conversations were had with your ecology officer. But I think they were quite keen that we finalised with a scheme which we knew would be effective and deliverable. Thank you. Well, members, I think we've given Mr Moffat a good grilling there. So thank you very much for taking the time to join us this morning and for fielding all the questions. Um, we will move on to our next public speaker now, please, which is, um, I think, Mr Phil Claridge, who's not a member of, but speaking on behalf of the Parish Council, as I understand. Thank you, Chair. I'm speaking explicitly with a motion that was authorised by the last Parish Council meeting and was notified via email to the representative officer. I have a lot of knowledge here. Okay, so, so you do have explicit permission from the Parish Council to represent their views today. 
correct, and I will be clear on any answers I give to you whether they're in the Q&A, whether they're my own opinion or the parish and okay. inside. Superb. Um, okay, well, same as the other speakers, three minutes to address the committee, at which point there may be some questions of clarification for you from uh, the members of the committee. Okay. I see you might have a presentation for us as well. Uh, there are three slides. It's not um, killing. Okay, uh, before you start, Councillor Khan, can you switch your mic off, please? Oh. Thanks. Okay, so three minutes whenever you're ready, please. Okay. <coughs> Apologies, Chair, if I may, can I just clarify that you can see the slides on screen? We can. <coughs> and um, Mr. Clary is pleased to rect me as to when you would like me to change the slides. Thank you. Yeah, I think just the next slide will be sufficient in the usual format. Thank you. Indeed. <coughs> we have a village design statement that's not been complied with and which will be eroded by precedent for future applications. Building height is limited by VDS condition uh, 6.1. The character of the village is 1.5 high story buildings. Uh, this change, we will, this then becomes a worrying precedent that will continue. Boundary treatment is a keystone of the VDS, in particular VDS condition 8.4. The original application included both a landscape buffer, this was the, and a ditch on the southern boundary. This was extensively discussed at the appeal. Next slide, please. Retention of the screen space was documented in the VDS development with South Cambridge. The ditch and landscape requirement was discussed with Lyndon at a parish meeting in 2019 for phase one that I attended. The landscape buffer is shown on the Linden design statement drawings that the officer has shown us. However, in December, we finally got the first drainage plans with the ditch clearly marked that's on the bottom edge. The ditch obliterates the landscape buffer. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> Follow the red line on the slide. Condition 8.4 is broken. In fact, condition 8.4 is not even referenced in the officer's report. It gets worse as described by Marianne. The boundary is not a dilapidated hedgerow. It's a 10 meter wide biodiverse corridor. It's not just brambles. It's bushes and trees have been admitted. Photos have been submitted and other objections evidencing this. Marianne said the plan is to remove all the vegetation within Linden's boundary. So the only biodiversity on the southern boundary is what is in the neighbor's gardens. VDS condition 8.4 requires biodiversity. There's a 62% loss on this site. The VDS working group intended that biodiversity should be retained on the site. The SP, uh, this is consistent with your own biodiversity SPD. That SPD also says that hedgerows should be retained and no exceptional case has been demonstrated as required by your biodiversity SPD to export diversity out of the village. In fact, the biodiversity assessment may even be null with this uh, boundary stripped. The sustainability has changed, as covered by the other speakers, with 200 more houses. The bus service will be, uh, on the plan of record, 1.2 kilometers away once the Bourne Airfield its development is complete. It's more than 800 meters at the moment. On precedence, I don't accept that nine infill houses in Meldrith is precedent for 74 houses in Caldecott, or that other comparisons with Water Beach are valid. This is an infill. Slide three, please. The VDS developed with you even drew out some of our design expectations. The key design VDS priorities have not been met. I urge you to vote against this development. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And well under the three minutes, so I appreciate your, uh, your promptness. Um, members, do we have any questions of clarity for Mr. Claridge? No, I can't see any, so that's straight to the point and very uh, very concise, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, members, uh, we do have a local member with us in the chamber, Councillor Hawkins. Do you wish to say anything now as a local member, or do you wish to save your comments to the debate? Okay, so Councillor Hawkins is saving your comments to the debate, which we are now in. So, <laughs> so members, I'll throw it open to you. Um, obviously, we can ask the case officer um, to pull up any uh, slides from his presentation and ask any further questions of clarification at this stage. Um, Councillor Williams first, then Councillor Daunton. Thank you, Chair. With your, with your discretion, I'll ask my clarification and then I might voice my opinion now or wait later in the debate. Um, so one of which was the village design guide. Um, if I could ask officers about its implementation and my recollection of the other site, just to sort of be mindful of consistency, 
what stage was it at when those building heights come in? Sort of, were we able, did we give weight or not at that stage? Because my recollection is we didn't. Um, but I just want to clarify, you know, where it was at then. Um, so that's one thing. If we could just clarify, I don't know if it's possible on the map, sort of this hedge retention issue and the entrances to the site, you know, so we can visually see exactly how much loss there will be. Um, the Where the map, the, the route goes through, because obviously we've got the objection for the definitive maps officer, and on the biodiversity, it was just mentioned about 62% loss on site. So is that something that we've we've recognised as well? Um, and um, yes, I think the other things are are things that are more my my views. So I'll, I'll okay. leave it there off my list. Sure. So I'm sure Mark has got something to share with us. But I think what I heard was three questions there, some clarification around the definitive maps officer's objection. Um, and clarification around the building heights and also some clarification around the off-site biodiversity net gain. Please. Sorry, Chair. There was, um, I did also want to see about the um, spread of the affordable housing. Okay. And the, yeah, the clustering of the affordable housing, please, Michael. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Williams, for a range of questions. Um, the village design guide, uh, Calumet Village Design Guide, was adopted in January 2020. First reserve matters or the reserve matter application for phase one was approved in November 2019. Um, so it was at a fairly advanced stage. I wasn't the case officer. Um, it couldn't be given full weight because it wasn't adopted, but it would have been able to be given some weight because it was a, an advanced stage. Um, unless I wasn't present at the committee, members may say otherwise, but that was my understanding. Um, and clearly, as highlighted in the report, it does get full weight as part of this application, and it, I have highlighted the conflict of the three story apartment building that weighs into your judgment today. Um, if I can clarify the heights, I think that was part of your question or Councillor Hawkins earlier. I've just updated the slides on my presentation. So if I share that again. Just added some uh, annotations which are on the plans already, um, but just for, for clarity, hang on one second. So this is one of the Aslin detached type B. It has a ridge height of 8.9 metres um, and a eaves height of 5 metres. Um, that's a semi-detached, um, similar in terms of size. This is a Beckett detached, um, 8.1 metre ridge height, 4.7 metre eaves. Uh, another detached house type, 8.2 metres and 4.7 metres eaves. And then the apartment building uh, with the 11.8 metre ridge and the 7.3 meter eaves. So hopefully that provides some clarification on the two, it's predominantly two story, um, but a range of two story heights. Uh, you asked about the buffer, which if it will let me, yes. This is the landscape plan. There is a, a landscape condition that would require more detailed plants and plans of this buffer, but the buffer in question is this green strip of land along here adjacent to the road. Um, I don't believe there's any intention to not provide that buffer. Um, it has to work in conjunction with the drainage scheme, but there are conditions uh, recommended as part of the consent that would deal with that fine detail. Uh, the public right of way, um, if I can stop sharing this and I'll share a different screen. So this map is taken from the Section 106 app, uh, obligation that was attached to the 2015 outline commission, um, which shows the blue line shows a uh, creation of a new bridleway that was to be provided um, with the developments. Um, as Mr. Moffat alluded to, that is currently the subject of a separate Section 73 application that's looking to provide a public footpath because the land available um, isn't wide enough to meet the county council specifications for a bridleway. Um, it is wide enough to provide a footpath, but that's subject to a separate application. Um, I don't believe that the layout of the site would preclude the provision of a public, public, public footpath, um, as indicated on this map, as set out in my report. But for clarity, um, the, the site before members is this southern part of here. So you do have the, that's the bridal way that's being referred to. Yeah. Just looking at the maps, obviously we've got the, the different um, areas there. It, 
the um, so if it can be a footpath, not a bridle way, are we actually sort of creating a stop and an impossibility for those on horses to be able to get from A to B, if that makes sense, or is there a nearby alternative route? Uh, so that question might be more applicable to the Section 73 application that I'll be bringing to members next month, um, which and I can show where the network is. But this, this bridle way as shown on here doesn't currently connect to an existing bridle way. The pink line is an existing public right of way, uh, which continues down to the south, and then 400 metres on from that, there is a bridle way. But those two blue lines, um, as shown there, wouldn't connect to an existing bridle way, but a public footpath would connect into an existing public footpath. If that's helpful. So, given the fact we do have an objection from the Defeated Maps Officer on this, is this actually relevant for this application then? Could we give any planning weight to that? Uh, I suppose you could because at the minute the condition stands on the outline consent that a bridle way um, is to be provided, but the practicality is a bridle way can't be delivered on site. There is a Section 73 application that will be coming to members next month for a decision um, that seeks to provide a footpath, but as it currently stands, a bridle way is required, but it's likely that. that Subject to members' endorsement, that situation will change. Okay. Do you want to come back? Um, yeah, it was just um, so I just got the, the spread of the affordable housing, but also my, my question around the height was their locations within the site. If we could see that again, please, particularly so not anything that's one and a half or two story because we know that that's within the design guide, but anywhere that's over that, just to see where it is. Yeah, so I think the two and a half and three storey buildings was what we like to see. Yeah, if you could just give me a moment to get the relevant plan up. So whilst the map's coming up, members, just to make you aware, we've got uh, councillors Daunton, Hawkins, Ripeth, Roberts and Fane to speak. Does anyone else wish to? Councillor Harvey and Councillor Khan. I'm not sure off the top of my head if there is a, a layout plan that would clearly show the heights of development. Looking across to Andy to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I've just typed in the word height and it hasn't come up. But okay. I can certainly share one that shows the clustering. Okay. I mean, we, we can come back to that point. So it's going to take a while to, to check. Yeah, if we can. I can do the affordable yeah. housing uh, or yeah, share okay. a plan for that. Um, bear with me. One, one screen. I'm not sure how clear it will be on the screen, but the green and the purple stars uh, represent where the affordable houses are located. Um, Do you so use the laser pointer if possible? Yeah. Uh, I'm not in PowerPoint, so unfortunately I can't. Oh. Um, but so on the northeast of, of northern boundary, I don't know if you can see where my cursor is at all, um, there's a, a row of affordable rented properties. Um, then to the south, there's a group of affordable rented and social houses. Um, the three-story apartment building um, sort of in the centre of the site is rented affordable. And on the western boundary, with the five purple stars, you've got another group of shared ownership affordable housing. I think that's all set out within the report. And in terms of the clustering, the mix and the tenure, that all complies with our housing strategy. And the council's housing team are happy. And as officers, we're happy that they've been integrated within the site. Thank you. Chairman, can I give my thoughts for debate and then I'm yeah. on? Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for the clarification. I realise I had a, had a list and I'm, I'm sure other members will as well. There um, was one more. Sorry. Oh, there was one you, more. You asked about biodiversity. Oh, yes, the 62%. Yes. Thank you for keeping um, me straight and narrow, Michael. Sorry. Uh, so this, yes, we've had extensive discussions with the Council's Ecology Officer. Um, the starting point was obviously to look at whether net gain could be achieved on site, and it, it couldn't, and the report reflects the findings of the metric. Um, I did contact Par uh, Caldicott Parish Council to ask if they were able to identify any land within their patch that they may wish to put forward. Um, as, as, uh, there's a, a, a site in Hardwick where the Parish Council has suggested parts of land where off-site net gain can be achieved as part of the development. Um, unfortunately, I didn't receive anything back from Caldicott Parish Council to identify land. Discussions continued with the council's ecology officer. Um, we looked at various options with the Wildlife Trust off-site, um, but the Lower Valley Farm scheme that's referenced in the report is uh, is a scheme that has been 
uh, there will be a financial contribution to as part of this development if approved. Um, that is a, a scheme within our district, um, and as Mr. Moffat said, we're still sort of grappling with how off-site contributions are managed and how far afield they can be. But our ecology officer is very satisfied that the financial contribution towards Lower Valley Farm would tick all the boxes in terms of achieving a biodiversity net gain. Although I do appreciate it's not within the same village, but that's not necessarily something that's unacceptable in planning terms. Okay, do you want to give your thoughts on the debate? Thank you. Um, so. So having heard that the, where the status of the village design guide, I do feel that obviously now we can give it full weight, that just going on the neighbouring um, phase one as a sort of, it's there already so we carry on, you know, I, I don't feel that that's a, an argument that we should be giving weight to. I think we should give more weight to the design guide um, because the lowering of the, of the properties, you know, other than a, potentially financial indication it's, it's not adding anything to the site um, as such we're not sort of setting a it's not creating what we call sort of a monument building or a focal point or anything like that it is just simply simply scale of housing um, so I, I do have concerns around the height of that and that boundary in between um, when you factor in the ditch because of course we didn't have a site visit for this application but many of us went on site for the first one so we are familiar with it and have seen it and I remember walking around in wellies um some some many years ago now and but I am concerned that by the time you've sort of factored that in that that boundary is incredibly tight and incredibly small um so I do have concerns from landscaping grounds that really we won't get anything meaningful achieved there um, the, I appreciate about the um, bridal way that is going to be looked for a footpath, but if we've given a condition of bridal ways, I think that probably is a valid reason for objection if it's something that was required at outline. Um, and I think it's important that we see these things through. We should be looking at all non-motorised users, um, not just pedestrians and cyclists. Um, on, the, on the infill, I think there's, there's plenty of policy to support refusing this on, on the infill basis of the category of the fact it's a group village. Um, we've acknowledged in advertising it's a departure site. That means it's not part of current plans. Um, and you know, the appeal, while we do give it weight, I would say that the from looking at it, it wasn't a case of this was great. It was a case of it was the lesser of two evils because we didn't have the land supply. So um, I don't think there's anything additional for myself in that appeal decision that gives this site anything other than numbers to be gained from it. Um, in relation to the biodiversity, uh, you know, I, I know we, we can talk about it in, in jest, but actually I, I do support it going out. It doesn't have to be the same parish. And I think particularly some of my parishes, you know, the, the 20 houses or so, so they're very small, so there will naturally be sort of borders. If it had been anywhere in the location, um, you know, you, you could relatively say that because, and I just, and I sort of made this mention um, at Cabinet actually about what biodiversity means, and a lot of people don't actually, you know, understand, and I myself looked it up when I became a councillor. But biodiversity is all the different kinds of life you'll find in one area, um, plants, fungi, microorganisms like bacteria and animals. Each of these species and organisms work together in an ecosystem. So having it, you know, these animals and organisms and things aren't going to be relocating to Fullbourne. It's, it's just not, it's too far away. If it was nearby, then if it was Hardwick, my view on it would, would potentially be different on biodiversity grounds. But I do have real concerns that that this isn't actually achievable, um, and so with all that in mind and balancing, you know, having looked at the appeal, um, pot potentially, you know, to me this is the wrong application for this site. Um, obviously, if it comes as an exception site, for example, then we may be saying there's more benefit than harm. But as we have the, the land supply the harm outweighs the benefit, in my view, Chair. Thank you. No, that's very clear. Thank you very much. Councillor Daunton, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. 
Um, a couple of the, two of my questions have already been asked and um, more or less answered. Um, thank you for the report, Mr. Sexton, for the detail in the report. Um, on page 13, um, paragraph 61, um, you mentioned that house types meet residential space standards. Do the apartment blocks meet residential space standards? Yes, all units within development meet national space standards. Right. Could you remind us what the national space standards are, please? I can share it on screen. Um, it's quite extensive, depending on house type, number of stories. That, number that's of current stories. national space standards. Yes. Yeah. No, no, I've got it. I can share that okay. now. Um, I'm, I'm, I was particularly concerned about the apartment blocks. Um, and, and also, could you just unpack a little um, the paragraph in the middle of that page, um, where I think the third sentence, um, first floor bedroom inside elevation of plot 125, only 15.5 metres from the rear elevation of plot 126, which is below recommended standards. That's a density standard, isn't it? I can, yes, I can answer both those points. So on the screen now is the um, policy for residential space standards. Um, as you can see, it's quite extensive in its detail. Um, and it, it talks about how big a single bed space needs to be and how big a double bed space needs to be. And if you've got a certain number of bedrooms, you have to have a certain number of um, uh, double bed spaces um, where you can and can't count head space if it's in a, a roof. Um, and it goes on to this table about how much uh, internal floor area is required for um, you know, one bedroom, two person flat. So I won't go through each house type individually, but certainly the development before you complies with what's set out within this policy, which okay. is quite complex. I, I think it's just useful to be reminded of that, particularly for the apartment blocks. Um, and then if you could answer the question about uh, the density is given as 28.46 dwellings per hectare. Um, but there seems to be a discrepancy between that and what's being said. In... Yes. So the, the separation distances um, aren't necessarily directly related to density, although I appreciate they, they do in a way. Um, the Council's District Design Guide sets out recommended separation distances to provide a reasonable quality of immunity to occupants. So if you've got two-story property back-to-back, -back, the Design Guide recommends a separation distance of, bit, of 25 metres um, to allow a reasonable amount of, to protect from lots of... Um, loss of privacy and overlooking. Um, when you've got a side facing window, uh, a, a rear elevation and a side facing elevation, that distance is reduced down to around 15, 16 meters. I can look up the exact figure. I think in the particular plot that you've referred to, there is a first floor window on the side elevation of one of the plots facing the rear elevation of uh, an adjacent plot, but that distance can be mitigated by the fact it's a bathroom window. Um, or it's a, a secondary window that can be obscure place and fixed shut. So it doesn't strictly comply with the recommendations of the district design guide, but the harm can be mitigated through a condition. And obviously the obscure glazing and fixed shut condition would prevent any significant loss of privacy. So that's satisfactory in planning terms. Are you saying this is a one-off or does this occur in other parts of the site? Uh, this, is a, this is where it occurs in the site. This is a one-off um, in terms of within the site. There is a property on the southern boundary that does have a first floor uh, bathroom window facing towards existing properties, but again, that's conditioned to be obscure, glazed, and fixed shut to pr uh, protect neighbour immunity. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I will speak now as a member if that's, if that's acceptable. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to um, Michael for this uh, report. It's detailed, it's clear. I don't think many people know this, but when Gladman's first brought this site to this council, it was Paul Sexton, his dad, <laughs> who was um, as the case officer at the time. So we're looking at a dynasty of planners. I, I imagine my dad was probably chairing. So. <laughs> and, your, and your dad was chairing, exactly. Um, there's uh, family businesses going on here. Um, the fact that we're actually here talking about this side is entirely the developer's fault for not bringing the reserve matters in at the right time for this 74. Um, but the situation is now different. 
to what it was then. And if I may, Chair, because ref reference has been made to the um, uh, appeal decision. Now, the decision uh, notice, paragraph 47, it says this proposal does not comply with all our policies, but the weight to be attached to the conflict with these policies is reduced because of the ongoing shortfall. No fiber land supply, our policies were out of date, and that really was why this site got planning permission. Simples. Situation now is we do have a five year uh, supply, we do have a current. Uh, local plan. And really, that is what we should be judging this um, application against. And whilst I take the points that um, Mr. Moffat has made, I think um, as far as the inclusion of this site in the first proposals go, you cannot attach weight to that. It's a first proposal. We haven't even drawn the draft proposals yet. So how can you give weight to it? Um, I am disappointed, I must say, that Mr. Moffat didn't even think to come and talk to the parish council or talk to me as the uh, uh, local member, because I recall the, 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 the team that did the previous um, phase did talk, did go to the DEP. Um, but on this occasion, I'm sorry, but they seem to be sticking two fingers up at us. Pardon my... <laughs> Pardon my phrase, but that is what seems to have happened. And I also must uh, remind uh, the committee that when phase one got planning permission, it was on the casting vote of the chair. I remember swearing for the first time in my life in public, and it got in the papers. You don't forget that easily. <laughs> so we need to be very careful here. When all is said and done, this is an application to build 74 houses on land outside the village framework of a group village, contrary to policy. And I'm afraid this thing about it's, it's like an infill development, as paragraph 89 alludes to, is just not right. I don't buy that, and I don't think we should. And the fact that we have a, a four-story building masquerading as a three-story building. Oh, come on, please. <laughs> the, the discussion on the, um, the three-story buildings in phase one was a long one. I remember that. And the fact that the, most of the third story was put into the roof. In this case, that's not even been done. It's not nearly the same as what is there now at all. And frankly, you know, when we have a village design guide that was, I mean, Codicott was one of the eight villages selected for this program because it was going to get a lot of development. So the VDG is there to actually guide the development that was coming. In this case, we have three-story buildings masquerading as two stories, a four-story building masquerading as a three-story building. I'm sorry, but it's still sticking two fingers up at the VDG. And it wasn't given the weight it should have been at the time, but that's another matter entirely. Um, you've heard a lot about biodiversity, so I will, I will leave that be, but there are sites closer to the village that we could have this biodiversity net gain on. I'm afraid that hasn't been explored properly. I mean, I know of one that I'm working on with one of the uh, uh, local youngsters, which is right in the middle of the village that we want to do something with. We've got the Peace Garden. We've got the uh, Triple SI uh, site just south of the village, which was mentioned. We've got Hadwick Woods. Are we saying that we cannot get the gain in any of that? Are we?
Okay, members, we're live again now. So thank you everyone for your patience. We're now, uh, we've now resumed this meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council's planning committee. We are currently on item five on the agenda, which is an application for 74 dwellings at the land east of Highfield, Highfields Road, Caldercott. Uh, we're currently in the debate section of this item. Uh, we've just heard from Councillor Hawkins, um, who I think we managed to just about cover all your comments before the live stream dropped out. So there's no need to, to repeat any of them. I think, I think we get the gist anyway of, uh, of where you're leaning with this particular application. So, um, <laughs> okay, Councillor Hawkins, if you'd like to continue. <laughs> if there's anything else you'd like to add. Yes, there is, I'm not done. Um, the issue of drainage, as you know, is quite an important one. Um, and what I would like clarification on from the LLFA is that on the, 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 um, uh, the calculations that um, were submitted, a lot of the, um, there's a lot of surcharging going on, um, which seems to me that if, if they're submitting something like that to us at this point in time, and there's um, a lot of the manholes. Beg your pardon, I'll, I'll find it in a minute. Just bear with me. Oh. Okay. It's part of what the, um, the parish council's response was, actually. Right, 45% of the drainage nodes are flood risk. I'd like them to clarify that as to how that is acceptable. Um, and currently, actually, phase one site, the water from that site is flowing onto the main road. And I know the, the, uh, the, uh, the site manager has said that there's, uh, they're looking at it and um, it might be that some drains are blocked, but what we know is that it is happening already. So having 45% of the nodes at flood risk by their own calculations is not acceptable. And you may also recall that the actual uh, drainage scheme had to come back to uh, committee for phase one <laughs> for approval. So drainage on this side is a big, big, big issue. Um, now, as far as the design goes, and following on from uh, Councillor Daunton's uh, questions, we see that the design doesn't meet our industry design guides. Um, and the urban design officer still has concerns that there are further areas of improvement in the design of this phase two. And I'm concerned for the amenity of the uh, houses on Clare Drive and especially Dams Pastures, which is kind of downstream from this site. Um, I've not convinced that they've done the best they can in terms of uh, the design for this. So, uh, yes, to finalize my comments, this is the wrong um, design for this site. It's not compliant with our own policies and it sticks to fingers at our VDG and should therefore, in my opinion, be rejected. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think if we take your questions of clarity around the drainage, I believe we're joined by Harry Pickford from the LLFA. Harry, are you with us? There you are. Morning. Good morning. Can you see and hear me okay? We can see and hear you fine, Harry, yes. Um, Brilliant. Did you pick up the uh, questions that Councillor Hawkins had around the drainage nodes? I did, yes. Um, so, in terms of the, the calculations that have been submitted, um, yeah, as, as you point out, there's there's quite a, a range of surcharging and uh, the note which states flood risk in the calculation results. Um, now, I think it's it's important to point out at this point that, that flood risk is kind of a high level of surcharge. So in the calculations, it sets out that, that for the, the, the system to be showing flood risk, it means it's within 450 mill millimetres of the cover level of the, the manholes themselves. So the water's sort of, it's not exceeding the system. Um, and, you know, that that is in line with uh, the kind of 
standards that we look for within calculations. So um, kind of I think the wording that that is within the kind of guidance we look at is uh, no water is outside the system in the one in 30 year uh, return period storm. And, um, you know, kind of acknowledging the, the flood risk is still within the system, albeit uh, within the 450 millimetres from the cover level. Um, so that's that's kind of, I, I don't know if that answers your, your question, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, no, it doesn't, if I may, Chair. Um, nowhere does it say that being at risk means it's at within 450 mil <laughs> of the surface. Um, at flood risk means at flood risk, it will more than likely uh, flood. And the fact that we already have water from this phase one actually flowing onto the road, High Fields Road, shows that perhaps we, you need to really look at this. Yeah, so uh, uh, the, the 450 millimetres from the cover of the manholes, that's uh, detailed within the, the calculations. Um, it's kind of a, a line within that. I, I have it on my screen if if it's possible for me to share. I don't know if that'd be, be useful just to show you where that is in the report. If it's handy, hurry up, please. I don't have the ability to share, I've just realised. <laughs> I don't know if it's possible Can, to, to give one of the permission. officers. Yes, bear Hello, with me Harry. and I will try and sort that for you. Is this going to take a while to pull up, Harry? No, uh, no, we think we're there. Yep, you happy? Yeah. If you just let me know once you can see see my screen. We can see. Brilliant. If so, you can zoom in a bit, that might help. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the the bit that I'm looking at in the calculations is is this line right here, um, and that's sort of setting out the margin for surcharging and flood risk. Um, so this is is setting up part of the model detail. Now, I believe the so I'll scroll out to zoom down a little bit because I'll make it quicker. Um, the part of the report that you're looking at is this surcharging, which is seen. Uh, this is a 30 year term period. So obviously, there's there's a lot of surcharging here, and then it's it's picked up a little bit more in the 100 year, which is this this part here, where it's showing the flood risk. So that's just stating that it's within the 450 millimeters as as set out. Uh, further on in the calculations. Does that answer your question? So what's the difference between surcharge and flood risk? Um, the difference between surcharge and flood risk is how high the water level is within the, the, the drainage network. So it's the, the flood risk is noted as the water is within 450 millimetres of the cover of the, the manholes. Okay, so yeah, we're getting a lot of very technical much. detail now. I think the officer has, has said that their view is the scheme is acceptable. How much weight we put on that as a committee is obviously up to us. So we, we've heard from the flooding officer there. Um, Councillor, do you want to make any further points or are you... <laughs> you uh... Okay. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm done. No, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, next we have Councillor Ripperth, please. I um, don't know if the officer would be able to, uh, Michael, if you could put up the more kind of green photos you had in your presentation. I think of Highfields Road, Caldercott. And if you've got any further, more expansive photos which show the location as it is currently. Is that possible, Michael? Was there a question around those images? When yeah, they well, it's more. Um, yes, thank you. That the top one, I think, helps um, with what I want to say, really. And um, on page 19 of the report, you referenced um, paragraph 91, the um, planning appeal in Bannard Road, Water Beach. And I mean, sadly, certainly from my perspective, I felt that it came back, it was um, allowed. Um, on appeal and one of the reasons given was that the area had become more suburban in nature as opposed to rural as it was previously um, and what happened so I don't want to go on about this too much because I do want to focus obviously on the application here but I think this is helpful what happened was 
like a domino series effect of five-year housing land supply sites, which um, um, I understand were um, refused at planning committee before I joined the council, and it went kind of one by one. And by the time we got to the end, because I can't think where else they can put houses now, um, we were left with a section which, you know, sadly is now a kind of building site and some more homes. It wasn't accepted as an exception site. Um, and the amenity is, you know, not, not really there for those extra houses, in my opinion, um, with doctor surgery um, capacity, et cetera. And yet we could all throw in the towel and say, right, we'll just let this happen because there's been previous five-year housing land supply sites. But we now have a local plan, which is adopted, the current one. We have a five-year housing land supply. Caldercott has its village design guide. And I don't believe this is like an infill site. And it's certainly way above the quantity of what infill should be for a group village. And looking at that photo, it still looks like a place which is semi-rural and it's got a certain beauty and if you look at the heights of the buildings they're quite low and that seems to be something about the village um, sort of layout for the village um, atmosphere and I think that's something worth keeping and therefore I will be voting against this application. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, we have Councillor Roberts. Please. Thank you, Chairman. Through you, Chairman. This application is arrogant because it ignores everything. It hasn't spoken to the parish council. It hasn't spoken to the local member. It's, do, it's uh, completely ignored the design guide. Um, it ignores the fact that we have got a local plan, a five-year housing supply, and it seems completely reliant on the only argument it's giving is that, well, appeal, appeal when we didn't have those things, um, was, was passed. And therefore, we are entitled now to come here to this uh, district council and uh, claim uh, that we've got every reason to have it. Um, how can it possibly be uh, an ill infill at 74. We're not talking about one or two houses or even a dozen or 20. We're talking about in the 70s. And um, it's, it is arrogant. I mean, it's, as for the designs of the houses, I, I think what uh, an aberration on design guides. I've never seen anything that looks actually quite so ugly um, in recent months brought to this council. The, the height of them, the utter boring design of them. There's no attempt here um, made to uh, have this as an attractive and, and wantable um, design for a village to have to put up with. I mean, just talk about taking it off the shelf. That's exactly what they've done. There's no effort here. There's no effort whatsoever in anything that they have done here. And um, absolutely, uh, we should throw it out on its heel and, and absolutely make sure that uh, they understand that we're not going to be putting up with this. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, with Councillor Fane, you're next to speak. Thank you, Chair. Um, like other members, clearly, I have some concerns about this application. Um, the first relates to the compliance with the village design statement. I accept that there are two tall buildings already in the village, but as uh, Councillor Hawkins has pointed out, the two tall buildings are rather more than three-storey, and some of the other buildings, including with dormer windows, are clearly rather more than two-storey. Um, the village design statement has become come into force since uh, we last considered phase one. So I think that is a new factor we have to take into account. Um, in passing, I would say that the 
apartments do not appear to have balconies. It's a factor that um, is important for uh, those who don't want to rely on uh, tumble dryers for drying their clothes and so on, if we want to keep, but I, I'm not going to put particular weight on, on that. Um, also in relation to the VDS is the concerns about biodiversity. Um, and clearly we do encourage developers to consider local first where they can. It isn't just that it's off site, but it's much of the biodiversity is some way off site and indeed there's a substantial reduction in biodiversity on site as part of this. Um, I suspect that if we were looking for, if the developers were looking for more biodiversity on site, they might be dealing with the ditch and what I gather is a 10 meter strip rather differently. I don't know quite what contribution that would make, but clearly that would increase the on-site biodiversity. However, having said that, I am aware that um, the biodiversity net gain is to development to the, the, this becoming obligatory, although the Environment Act has passed, is develop, dependent on, on um, amendments to the Local Government Act, and that won't happen probably until next year. Um, and indeed, the, te the, the proposals are technically compliant, as has been pointed out. There are a number of issues on the VDS also relating to drainage, but I think those have been more than adequately covered by others. I think what we have to look at, however, this is a departure from our local plan, but considering the appeal back in 2017, and I accept what Councillor Hawkins says that it's the developer's responsibility that the reserve matters were not brought in time. But considering that appeal and the development that has taken place on the northern part of this site since, I think we have to consider whether this is just infill. I think in this case the, the scale of infill is less important than the, uh, the question of the eastern fringe, which is, um, you know, this, this site does bow out into the countryside beyond um, just infill. I, having said all that, I'm not convinced, I'm not going to make my judgment on this, but were this to go to appeal again, I'm not convinced that our concerns would stand up. You know, we do have an obligation under the MPPF the presumption in favour of sustainable development, admittedly in approving an up-to-date development plan, which was not there at the earlier stages. And so I think that probably we do not have sufficient reason, giving the officers advice, to refuse this application. And therefore, despite my concerns, I come to the conclusion that probably we ought to accept the officer recommendation and approve. Okay, thank you for that. Um, members, I've got one, two, three, four more speakers to go. Um, just to clarify, the concerns I've had raised so far and I've noted down uh, are related around contradiction to the village design guide, issues around landscaping, issues around non-compliance with the bridal way condition, uh, the fact it's outside the village envelope, um, the off-site biodiversity net gain isn't near Caldercott, and drainage and the five-year land supply is now in place. So, members, if, um, so those last speakers, obviously those points have been covered. So if there's anything new or additional you would wish to raise, uh, or if you wish to give a view, then please do. Um, but I will obviously still come to you in turn, and we will carry on. But just to reiterate, those points have been covered. Councillor Harvey. So hold on, Councillor Hawkins. Um, there was also the amenity of the um, residents on Clay Drive and Dams Pasture, which I raised. Okay. And neighbour neighbouring amenity as well. Councillor Harvey, please. Yeah, just um, thank you, Chair. A concern really that the, the logic whereby we can't make the biodiversity net gain on site um, and, and therefore seem to switch to abandoning all attempts to retain any biodiversity. I'm thinking about that um, hedgerow. Um, and take it all off-site. That, that seems a rather clunky logic because 
we should be trying to retain where we can biodiversity, and only then the deficit is exported. Okay, thank you. Councillor Khan, please. <laughs> I found this a very difficult application. Like the uh, officers, I found it very balanced. Um, uh, the, I take the point about the biodiversity on site. The, the problem here is that you have an initial application, which was done when we didn't have a five-year land supply, when 140 houses were proposed at a, a, quite a high density. In the first phase, the, all, the, all the main opportunities of biodiversity on site were used. And so you have a small area left, and if you're going to get the remaining 74 houses in, it's going to be very dense. Um, so it's very difficult to get it. You could get a bit more, but if you're going to get the numbers. But now we're in a situation where the initial argument uh, of five-year housing land supply doesn't, supply, uh, doesn't apply, so should we be going for 74 houses? Um, does the 140 house um, number actually act as a bind? If we had 60 houses, for instance, you might be able to do much better. Um, and we also have the problem that the, uh, when you had a housing land supply, the issue of transport and accessibility uh, was overwritten because of the shortage of housing. Now we have a situation where you're quite away from uh, the development, and the Camwell to Cambridge uh, housing uh, uh, transport uh, hub has not been made, and we don't yet know where it's going to be, and it's been a constraining factor on all the new development that's been proposed on the, on the Hardwick to um, uh, Camp West Camborne site. Um, it seems to me that we ought to be, this is 70 houses, it's going to make an impact, we ought to be considering that, and we ought to perhaps be waiting until we know what's going to happen about that before we make a decision. On the basic principle that you've got development to the north, you've got development to the south, which is dense, quite dense. Uh, I mean, if you go to the, I had, uh, my son had German lessons for about six, three months at the house on the development immediately to the south, and that is very similar, uh, if not more dense, than the one that's going, uh, that's going on here. So I don't see the density in itself a problem. The problem is that the, there's not enough left for the biodiversity within the site, um, and there appears to be concerns about the drainage, which might perhaps be more, you might have a larger margin if you, uh, if you had more land to, to play about with. Um, so um, if the first phase of this development had gone on the southern part of the site, then I think the argument would have not stood as that it was infill. But you've got development to the north, you've got development to the south, you've got one boundary, in the, uh, you've got the, the record of the previous application uh, which has been approved. I think you're going to find it difficult to feel in principle to accept that there will never be development here. My question is what about timing? Should we really be waiting for the, to see if this applicant site goes in the local plan, which I think there's a very good chance that it will in the final local plan, uh, uh, and then set different standards in terms of density, um, or, or, or which will give more op opportunities, or should we just think, oh, maybe we'll get a worse deal then, maybe we won't get the same deal, should we accept what we've got is perhaps the best we can go to get? And that's what's been tormenting me in trying to consider this application, <laughs> and I find it very difficult to come to a decision. Um, but I think possibly my, uh, I'm going to come around to the decision that it's premature with lack of knowledge about the transport infrastructure uh, to know whether we're going to be able to get adequate transport infrastructure. Um, and we should wait for the local plan before we decide that it probably will be in the local plan, but at this stage it's perhaps premature for, for, for decision making. So are you coming down on the side of refusal or deferral? At the moment, I'm tempted towards refusal, but it's, it's okay. very marginal. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, like everyone else, I, I see we're here through almost through a series of unfortunate events. We didn't have a five-year housing land supply. We didn't have a local plan. There wasn't a village de design guide. But here we are now with all these things. And, um, and I too have um, concerns about biodiversity, about the transport. So I am very uncomfortable with this application and I am coming down on the side of refusal. Okay, thank you. Councillor Ellington, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, most people have said all the things that I was going to say. I was going to rabbit on about biodiversity and the fact that um, if you have a design plan 
and you've accepted it, then you have to stick by it and various other things. But I think the new thing that I want to bring to this uh, discussion is that we're talking about a population, I believe, of being about 714. And we're talking about introducing another 74 houses to that. I know in my village I've got 1,100 houses and I've just had 200 lumped on me. And to bring those new people into a community when you are a very small community is significantly bigger than the challenge that I'm facing. And on those grounds, we have a five-year land supply. We do not. We have a group, home, group um, village here are designated, they shouldn't have more than 12 houses built on them, and we're talking about putting another extra 74. I cannot believe that that is right. I will vote against. Thank you. If you could pop your mic off. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Rippeth, I saw you indicating earlier. I didn't know if it was about something earlier or something new. Kind of something. I just want to re-emphasise. I promise I'll be really quick because you're giving me a second go. Um, I think we've got quite a good list of reasons for refusal and I just want to say why have policies, why have um, design guides if you're not going to really implement them and you know take it and not say oh well it might get refused. I think, I'm sorry, it might be allowed on appeal. I don't think that's what we're in the business of doing. We're in the business of looking at what's in front of us and deciding on its merits or otherwise. And I just want to really emphasize that point about amenity. It is absolutely crucial because if you have people moving into a village and there aren't the amenities there to support them and to support the whole population, it becomes incredibly difficult and it has a really negative impact. And the sustainability of the site at the moment, I frankly just don't think it's sustainable currently there isn't a transport. And I have finished, so don't worry, I won't put my hand back up again. No, that's fine, it's a point well made. Um, okay, members, those are all the speakers. I think uh, most members have given a view one way or the other, so I think we are in a position to be making a decision on this. Um, I'm gonna pass over to Mr. Sexton, who I think has been beavering away writing up the reasons for refusal based on the debate. So, Michael, I don't know if you could share that with us on the screens. I can, Chair, and I will need clarity on a few of the reasons that have been cited by members, please. Um, I may need to draft this further um, following this discussion. Uh, so, certainly picking up from members unhappy with the, the principle of development, so as set out in the report, it does conflict with a lot of the Council's um, core policies. So, I've drafted the reason for refusal that is outside the framework of a, a group village um, and represents uh, an unsustainable form of development. And I'm also picking up that members would be of the view that it would represent encroachment into the countryside as well, which is why it's so I can take that highlighting out. So that first reason is, is sort of to catch yeah, the, the sustainability and the countryside encroachment. Um, I've drafted the reason on scale that with particular reference to apartment block see that by virtue of that scale it's inappropriate and incompatible with its location and therefore contrary to local plan policies and also uh, guidance note 6.1 of the county Cooperative design guide which is the one that specifically references 1.5 and two stories um council hawkins you, you began to talk about the general design concerns i think councillor roberts also started alluding to those so clarity on whether members feel the design as a whole is not suitable would be welcome that I can draft something to that effect if that is a reason members would want to. Sure, okay. I'm getting some nods from around the room. Um, and generally, the committee, are we agreed that that is a reason we have concerns around and should be refused upon? Anyone not? No, okay, so I think that's and clear. Would members be happy with a, a, a standalone reason for the apartments and then a separate reason, as I've sort of got here, for design? Or would you want it in that? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, and then the, the landscape buffer, um, which I assume relates to the southern boundary, has come up a few times, so I'd just appreciate some clarity on the particulars, particular issues with that, and I've drafted 
So I think from what I understood, and correct me, members, if I'm wrong, actually I'll throw it to Councillor Hawkins. Go on. Uh, thank you, Chair. For you, the issue is that um, there is currently a biodiversity um, border along there, which has been removed, <laughs> and sleight of hand trying to use the ditch as the um, as landscape buffer, which it's not. <laughs> there is no space there to actually have a proper border. They should leave the border that's there now, do the ditch, and then put their roads. But they're not doing it. I think it's a loss of landscaping, Michael. I think it's the concern there. Fine, okay. Over fine, further due course. Um, I've also picked up that the public right of way, um, which yes, you can give weight to because it is an existing condition. So I've just drafted something to the effect that the layout um, doesn't make provision for the bridle way that's required um, as part of condition 20 of the outline consent as part of the wider development. Um, and in terms of linking that to policy, policy TI2 of the local plan um, has a couple of criteria that talk about the provision of new and um, cycling and walking routes to connecting the existing networks. So that, I think, would be the policy, relevant policy catch. So again, just confirmation from members that they would want to include public right of way. Mm -hmm. That was raised as a concern during the debate, members. Is that, does that encapsulate what we're, what our concerns are? Yes? No? Yes? Okay, I'm getting some nods from around the room, Michael. Sorry, Councillor Roberts, did you want to? Thank you, Chairman, on? if I could add. Uh, I think we were also concerned, and uh, Councillor, and Harvey, I think, actually mentioned this, about the density and the fact that um, it, it's, it's only going on the sort of previously agreed numbers, which were at a specific difficult time, and that no consideration is being given now to um, have a much lower uh, number here. And, and that density of 74 is just unacceptable. And I think we need to put that somewhere in here that um, you know, that density is, is, is just not on. Could, could that be captured in the design element, Michael? I, I can add something to the general design reason. Obviously, just to highlight, um, the first reason for using the uh, wall specifically reference at 74 dwellings is, is not suitable, uh, but unsustainable form of development. But if you see density as an issue, then I can incorporate that into a, a part of the design. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Hawkins? If I may, um, <laughs> the applicant made reference to the inclusion of this site in the first proposals. Yeah. And perhaps what people don't realize is the number in the first proposal is 64, not 74. Yeah. So it's a lower number, which reflects what we're talking about in that it's too dense for what it is. So, Michael, would what I get gathered in that would probably be better included in the first reason for refusal? Yes. Around the, the physical number of dwellings? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. I, I don't disagree, and I think that is a thing, but um, just guidance as to whether perhaps the numbers qualify rather than not being happy with the density because looking at the, the DPH, but actually overdevelopment of the site. Yeah. Um, as opposed to sort of the density, whether that would be yeah. a be a better ground for a, better wording. The, yes, the the fact that is there's more housing is yeah. is over development yeah. rather than if that would help. Okay. So the square the question, the, circle. Is, the question is around the wording whether we actually specify the number as an issue or just it, we think it's over development. I don't know if the officers had a view on that. Um, I'd probably suggest if members feel that the number is a design issue, that I'll incorporate that into the second design uh, reason for refusal. Um, I think obviously we've stated 74 in terms of quantum as the first reason, but I can I can draft something about density in the second design. Reason. Okay, I think that'll be that'll be handy. Uh, I think you had some others at the bottom of your list, Michael. Um, you I do. Yes, I just appreciate. I know drainage um, has been a concern for many years in this site. Whether members. I know Councillor Hawkins raised it, and um, we heard from Harry Pickford. Uh, there's obviously no technical objection to the scheme, and there are details from the outline that have been approved, so I'm just keen to understand if members saw grounds for refusal on drainage. I, my opinion is that there isn't, but I'm open to hearing your thoughts. Councillor Hawkins? If, if I may, um, we had something similar with the first phase, where the calculations were showing a lot of um, uh, flood risk or at risk um, at flood risk 
nodes. And one of the reasons, which is one of the reasons why the condition was given to bring back the revised design to the committee, actually you did that, <laughs> um, because of the concerns that we'd raised. And as I said, we already have water coming off phase one. I know it's not finished, but we already have water coming off phase one onto Highfields Road. So as far as our experience goes, drainage, it just it, it needs to be tighter. If, say for example, we had only 10 nodes at flood risk, you might go, okay, but you've got 45% of the nodes in that design at flood risk. I'm not a flood engineer, but I'm sorry, but I just, I just fail to see how that cannot be of concern. At flood risk should be minimal, <laughs> not nearly half. How would we tackle that one, officers? Um, if I can come back, I know that the, I think this was my first involvement when I brought back the section 73 on drainage on the first site. That was to do with the fact that the soil type that was used for the testing was incorrect. Um, my understanding is that testing has been done pr correctly this time round. There are a number of conditions, um, including a condition about how surface water would be managed during the construction phase, which I think was probably absent from the phase one and the outline consent. I think that's something that we've realised needs to happen. So, again, I'm not sure on crafting a reason for refusal that would, that would stand up, but happy to. Okay, members, I think the question is, do we, given that advice, do we really want to include drainage as a reason for refusal, given the fact it's unlikely to hold up? Obviously, we can. That's a gift up to us. Do any members have any views? Councillor Roberts. I think stick to the ones that we feel will actually, uh, we can stand up. I think, I mean, we've all seen that field, and I remember going um, some years ago and seeing the area, and it, it's very, very wet. I mean, there's huge amounts of water on there. But if we don't have the professional support, maybe, you know, let's have a fewer but really strong ones. And I think we've got some really strong ones. Yeah, I think there was more of an argument about sewage, if I remember, and maybe the local member can remind me. But, um, no, I, I wouldn't push for that, this one in particular. Okay. Thanks. I mean, yeah, I mean, for me, I think the reasons we have so far are concrete. I don't think there's any, well, I might be wrong, but I don't think there's any argument against those. Um, Michael, we have biodiversity and neighbour amenity as well on your list. Yeah, so on biodiversity, obviously we have, or the developer has demonstrated, but there will be a 10% net gain in biodiversity, albeit through an off-site contribution that's not within County Cop, um, but it would be fully policy compliant. So I'm unsure whether we'd be able to draft a reason for refusal and then defend a reason for refusal that was along the lines of, of members not being satisfied that the net gain was within the village or within the parish. So again, just a clarification and debate around that would be helpful. Okay, Councillor Hawkins. We do have a hierarchy of uh, achieving biodiversity net gain. And I think in my view, we've not explored that properly on this occasion. Um, we have lots of places around the village that we could, that gain can be achieved. And frankly, it just, it seems bizarre to me that we are the ones taking the pain, potentially, of 74 new homes, but with none of the biodiversity um, um, benefits, when we have areas that we could use. I mean, I don't know why the parish council didn't get back to you. I can't explain that. But I know of four sites where we can actually achieve biodiversity in that game. But, you know, open to... Um, Legal advice on that one. I can see Mr. Reeves wants to come in with some legal advice. Um, I might say if they had come and talked to the parish council, we wouldn't be in this situation. I think the point's been made. Thank you. I think the preference for more local net biodiversity gain could be addressed in terms of the delegation. Um, to officers to deal with the planning obligation. So I don't think you should put all of your eggs in, bar in the basket of saying that's a reason for refusal because uh, you could address it through a planning obligation were you minded to, to, to grant. Well, members, that's the advice we've had from officers and legal advice. So given that, do we want to include this or, or no? Councillor Williams, I know you indicated earlier. I was just going to ask if there's a cascade in the, in the policy um, 
in relation to biodiversity, you know, like we have affordable housing on exception sites, there's like a cascade of areas. Um, can we say that we don't think it's it's relevant to the cascade, if that is the case? Michael? I don't think we have a policy at this time that would allow us to refuse the application on that basis. I think certainly the preference will be and is as emerging to look on site first and then in the local area, you know, similar to we do with affordable housing. But my recommendation to member states is that we don't have a policy basis to refuse the application on, on that particular reason. Okay, well, that's the advice we have. Councillor Khan? I, I was just wondering whether, I mean, the, the concern is that we'd like to have, would have preferred to have more of the net gain on site than, than uh, and, uh, and any uh, off site near us. That, that's the concern. I agree with you that it's difficult in, in grounds. Uh, but in fact, it relates in part to the density that, and the number of houses that are on site. And so perhaps it could be mentioned as an explanation in the, uh, it, when referring to the number of houses to say that that restricts the amount of gain. Just mention that it restricts the amount of gain on site rather than having this as a separate reason for refusal, which I understand is going to be difficult to defend. Um, is that, would that be possible not have it as an individual reason, but perhaps incorporate it into one of the others? Yeah, I, th I can make a reference in the second okay. design region. Yeah, for me, that's probably the, the, the more sensible way forward if, uh, if we are going to vote refusal on this. Um, indeed. Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think it was along similar lines. I was just going to say that sort of the landscaping and, and the design does not enable for um, any biodiversity retention, yeah. which obviously is, is first and foremost the priority. I think that's been, been noted. I can see Michael beavering away. Um, and neighbour Amina, sorry, did you want to talk on biodiversity? Uh, and that is what leads to part of the issue on the neighbour amenity. <laughs> because they've stripped off, they're planning to strip off all that yeah. sure. edge. So. Which then opens clear dry and dams pastures out into the yeah. new development. Yeah. Okay, so Michael, I'm guessing you're asking us for some clarity around the neighbour amenity Yes, issue. Because normally your neighbour amenity would be on grounds of overlooking or loss of light, um, the separation distances between the proposed properties and existing properties are in excess of our design guidance. So it is the view of members that the loss of that existing boundary has a detrimental effect on neighbours and if so, sort of what what impact do you consider that, what negative impact do you consider that to be in policy terms? Yeah, Councillor Hawkins. Sorry. At this point in time they have greenery behind them. Um, once that is taken off, then they'll have this concrete jungle looking at them. I don't know, I don't know how to express it, is it, that. Is it visual? Is it is name? visual. Okay. It is visual. So it actually is also the character of that existing part of the village. Okay. So the character is being affected and the amenities being affected. Um, Councillor Williams, then I'll come to the officer. Thank you. Um, I believe the words we sometimes use, it affects the street scene. And, and from the other side, for the existing, it would affect the street scene from there for them given the lack of um, foliage and, and landscaping. So it would be on the existing street scene from that side that it would be affecting their amenity. Okay, uh, let's hear from the officers then what their thoughts are. So I think those reasons all relate to design and character rather than neighbour amenity. So loss of a view isn't some, a material reason for refusal, but i um, happy to maybe emphasise a point within the design um, but I, I take the point that you, know, you lose a greenery, you look out to a, a, a new development site, but I don't think that is harmful in neighbour amenity terms and policy terms to sustain a separate reason for refusal, but I can allude to it in the design. Yeah, could that be incorporated in the design reason that we've... Yeah, we've I don't provided. think it would be a standalone. Yeah. Um, okay, I think... Sorry, Councillor Khan. Uh, are you going to introduce anything about accessibility and the, and the, the fact that the uh, Cambridge to... Then it might be premature for the local plan, um, um, uh, uh, and the fact that the, uh, we we're not sure what's going to happen about the Cambridge to Camborne um, fast mm. transport yet. I'm uh, not sure we can allow that, but I will throw to because obviously we have to judge it on what's okay. happening today. But I will ask officers for an opinion on that. I, no, I don't think we can mm. incorporate that. I think those issues are sort of captured in, in the first reason for you in mm. terms of the sustainability of the site as it stands today. Okay. So I wouldn't propose anything additional. Okay, members. We have a comprehensive list of reasons for refusal now, should we decide to, to go that way? Um, 
OK, I think we're at the point now when we can probably have a, a vote on this, please. I think we do need a vote because I have a differing views. Uh, and this is a major application, so I think it's more sensible. So, Aaron, if you could fire up the, the voting system for us, please. So, members, as usual, <coughs> press the blue button on your screens to register. You wish to vote. If you wish to support the application and approve, press green. If you wish to not support and refuse, press red. And if you wish to abstain, press yellow. How many of us are there? Okay, 11. So, it's still one more to vote. Okay, I think that's everyone. Aaron, if you could show us the results, which are on screen now. So one vote in favour, 10 votes against, so that is refused. Sorry, Mr. Blaisby wants to come in. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just for clarity, um, we will draft the final reasons for refusal and pass those by Chair and Vice Chair for final sign yep. if that's okay, Chair. Understood. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, members, so that application is refused. Thank you, everyone, for your input on all of that. I appreciate it's uh, taken a few hours to get through that, but I appreciate everyone's patience. Okay, members, um, I'm going to start the next item now. Uh, it's item six, which is on pages 71 of our agendas. This is an application at Bancroft Farm Church Lane, Little Abington. The proposal in front of us is demolition of existing agricultural buildings and erection of five dwellings and conversion of two redundant barns to form a detached dwelling and an office. Uh, the applicant is uh, Cheffins, who are the agent on behalf of the landowner. We have, again, a raft of key material considerations in our papers. Um, the application is before us because the officer recommendation is in contravention to that of the parish council. And, yes, I think that is it. So, okay, Mr Sexton, we're over to you again as the presenting officer. So, any updates to the report in front of us? And then please introduce the report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. No updates. Um, just closing County Cot and getting Abington ready. So yes, this is uh, an application for the demolition of existing dilapidated agricultural buildings, uh, erection of five dwellings, conversion of two barns, one into a detached dwelling and one into an office at Bancroft Farm, uh, Little Abington. Um, the application is, is also back before members because you previously considered um, the previous scheme on this site, uh, which was refused, and I'll come on to that through the presentation. So the location, uh, this is the site location in Little Abington, adjacent to a PV, a protected village immunity area, uh, which I'll make clearer on the next slide, and you can see some existing buildings that will largely be removed to accommodate the proposed development. So in terms of constraints, the site is within the development framework boundary of Little Abington, and um, it's also uh, more or less entirely within the conservation area, which is this pink line. Um, there is a my, my presentation is wrong. I haven't updated it from the previous one. Apologies. It's not partially within a protected village immunity area. It is entirely outside of the village protected village immunity area, which is the dark pink. So it runs along the edges of the site. You've got a grade two-star listed church to the south of the site um, and public rights of way denoted by the blue lines. Uh, again, these are, are visuals of the street scene. So you're looking north along church lane uh, with the site on the right hand side this is one of the existing buildings to be retained and converted and um, there's a junction with west field um, just up here so this is the view looking across the site fairly open with some some existing structures um, this is a view from the corner of, of Bournemouth road towards the application site which is down in here this is an open view across to the field behind which is the protected village community area and just a view down towards the the church, along Church Lane, which you can't see in this photo, um, just to show the, the general character of the street as it currently stands. On the, to the west of the site, you have existing uh, single-storey properties. Uh, there are also sort of two-storey properties within the vicinity. Um, and again, this is a view down to the church, which is down here. And this is one of the existing buildings to be retained and converted. And just some more views. And this Bottom uh, is a view across the public right of way, so we're looking across the back of the site and you can see the church over the top. 
This is the proposed site plan. So you've got plots one, two, three, four, and six are the new residential properties that are being proposed. Um, plot five is a converted and slightly extended exist existing barn that you've just seen on the photos. And barn A is an existing building that's being converted into an office space. Um, these were provided in the plan pack, so I won't spend too long, but they're, um, most of the properties are a single story um, proposed buildings to sort of reflect an agricultural um, courtyard. This is the largest and the only one and a half story building on the site uh, in plot two. Um, everything else as you can see is a fairly simple uh, single story unit. And that's the existing barn that's being converted and slightly extended. That's the new plot six. And then this is the existing barn um, the, really the only alterations to that are fenestration, detailings and internal works to convert it into office space with a section of the barn to be demolished. There are some visuals to provide you with this time, which I don't think we had um, last time, which just show how the development would sit within the existing street. Um, so this is plot, uh, the plot six or plot five nearest to the street. Um, a key change that I'll come on to is that this has been reduced in height from the previous proposal and also stepped slightly into the site. <coughs> um, and this is a, a visual from the public right of way which I showed the photo of earlier and how the development would sit and the church um, tower you would still see through the development and in context with some of the existing development two-story development along uh, church lane to the south so the previous reason for refusal as set out in detail in the report was um, on the basis that the development encroached into the protected village community area um, therefore contrary to policy the red line boundary no longer encroaches into the PVAA, so officers are satisfied that um, reason for refusal has been addressed. The second reason for refusal related to the site and scale in Massingham development, in particular plots one and six, um, and then being dominant in the street scene, negatively impacting the conservation area and setting of the church, um, with reference to views from the public right of way as well. Hopefully this slide is helpful just to give you a comparison. The current scheme uh, that you look before you today is at the top and the previously refused scheme is at the bottom. So you can see where the red line has been reduced and um, so to remove the development from being within the PVAA. Plots, previously there were plots one and two. Um, now you've just got plot one which has helped to take the built form away from the public highway to reduce the visual impacts um, and improve the, that soft landscaping that can be incorporated. And plot six, although it's in a similar location, has been reduced in height by four to 500 millimetres and stepped into the site slightly. So you then read the existing barn at plot five um, as the one being immediately adjacent to the site. So hopefully that just provides a helpful reminder um, to the, between the two schemes. Again, a range of uh, material considerations also out in the report. I've asterisked the, um, the key ones in my view because they relate back to the reasons for refusal being the, the protected village community area uh, character and heritage impact, um, but subject to conditions set out in the report, officers are satisfied that the proposal is otherwise policy compliant. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thank you for that introduction. Um, members, we have uh, a few public speakers for this particular item, and we're going to start with our first public speaker, Isabel Smith, who joins us in the chamber. Isabel, if you'd like to come forward to the mic. So to switch it on, it's the button on the right. Press that and press it again to switch it off. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming in person today to speak to us. Um, I know you've probably heard me say this before, but it, all speakers get three minutes to address the committee. And at the end, if you could just remain, remain in your seat in case there are any questions of clarification from the committee for yourself. So whenever you're ready, please. Thank you. I represent the views of 12 households who live alongside Bancroft Farm. We continue to object to the development plans. We feel that the current proposals have not addressed the reasons the planning committee gave for refusal in February 2021, and the development will not preserve the character of the conservation area. Reason one for refusal was encroachment into the PVAA. Well, most of the garden of plot one is still within the PVAA. Next slide. Reason two for refusal said that the siting, scale and massing of the development would significantly erode the undeveloped nature of the site and its rural quality. It said that the siting of plots one and six adjacent to the pavement on Church Lane would represent an overly dominant and prominent form of development. 
which would detract from the character and appearance of the conservation area. The new plans show that plot six has only been moved less than a metre back from the pavement. The house is five and a half metres tall, as tall as the lamp post, and taller than the existing flint barns. Plot six is now one and a half metres longer due to the addition of a new gable, so that it extends further up Church Lane, very close to Oak Tree T4. With the building of plot six, we lose the undeveloped rural quality of the conservation area. Next slide, please. Plot one is side onto the lane. It's, one, it's five and a half metre tall gable, is only six metres from the edge of the road, so the views from the far end of Church Lane will now be dominated by the new house. Houses on the other side of the lane are set well back, with mature trees lining the lane. The conservation officer says the proposals will not harm the character of the conservation area, but not harming is not the same as preserving or enhancing. Reason two for refusal also said plots one and six would be evident in views to the south towards the church, a grade two star listed building, and so would impact its setting. Because one, plots one and six are so large, and because they sit on the roadside, they will dominate the views down the lane to the church. The conservation officer says the development will not harm the setting of St Mary's Church, but we feel it neither preserves nor enhances its historic appearance. Next slide, please. Trees. We are concerned and disappointed that over 40 trees will be cut down, leaving only two veteran trees, the beech T7 and the oak T4. Even these will be damaged. The lower branches of the beech will be sawn off and 20% of the root protection zone will be laid to hard standing. The tree officer said that it is unacceptable for the new hard standing by plot one to be so close, close to the beach. The new homeowners may park on the grass by their front door, further damaging the roots. When we are encouraged to protect biodiversity, the treatment of the trees is unexpectedly harmful. If you could sum up, please. Yeah, last slide. To protect the undeveloped and rural character of the conservation area, we ask you to reject the current proposals and we look forward to new plans which meaningfully address the reasons for refusal. That's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, members, do we have any questions of clarification for Ms Smith? Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm just referring here to uh, our report, paragraph 124, which says on balance, officers are satisfied that the proposal has responded positively to the heritage harm that was identified in the previous refused application, um, especially with regards to plot six. Now, if I hear you correctly, you are still saying that that is not sufficient uh, in your view? Right. Yes, I think the, the changes that have been made are very modest. Um, effectively, the visual effect remains. The house has only been moved back less than a metre. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Members. Councillor Wilson, please. Uh, I'd like some, it may come later with um, the officer, but I'd like some clarification about whether it does or doesn't encroach on the PBAA, because in the, in the report it says it doesn't, and um, our public speaker says it does, so I'd like some clarification around that, please. Sure. Well, Ms Smith, perhaps you'd like to clarify that point you made earlier. Do you think it does still encroach the PBAA? Yes, the boundary of the PBAA is not straight. It actually... Um, has a number of sort of, um, of, of alterations. It, it's not linear, and I don't think that's been reflected accurately on the diet, on the plot, on the on the site plan. Uh, Michael, we can come back to this in the debate if you like, unless you'd like to try and tackle it now. I think if we could come back to it, I'll just pull a yeah. few maps okay. up to help with that. As well. Okay, if you could ask that again later, Councillor Wilson, that'd be handy. Thank you. Uh, any further clarification questions for our public speaker? No. So it just leaves me to say thank you very much for coming in and joining us today. Um, appreciate you waiting. <laughs> it's, uh, it's difficult to tell when these things are going to come around, but thank you very much for your patience. Okay, next speaker we have um, are the agents on behalf of the applicant. We have Mr. Simon Gooderham. 
and also Mr. John Jennings. Good afternoon, welcome both of you. Um, I'm not sure who's who's kicking off, but uh, is that Mr. Mr. Gooderham? Yeah. So it's the button on the right hand side of your microphone switches it on and off. Uh, as with the other public speakers, three minutes to address the committee. And obviously there may be some questions of clarification for yourself at the end. So if you both stay seated, that'd be useful. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Simon Goodrum speaking uh, on behalf of the applicant um, as their agent and advisor. Uh, the planning committee report prepared by Michael Sexton um, clearly sets out the extensive work and the changes to the scheme which have been undertaken uh, to address the previous reasons uh, for refusal. Um, it also confirms there are no technical objections uh, to the development of the site and his recommendations to you to approve the application are welcomed. We engaged with the Parish Council on the 23rd of April 2021 and received some positive uh, feedback to the design changes and these were reported to us on the 30th of April 2021. Uh, the responses to the consultation process have been fully taken into account in the new application that is being considered today and just to summarise these include the following significant changes. The entirety of the scheme is now outside of the PVAA, including both the built development and the gardens of the new properties, uh, despite uh, some claims to the contrary. Whilst the number of dwellings has remained the same as six units, the office units have been reduced from two units to one single unit, and this has allowed one of the barns to be converted to a dwelling and therefore reduces the uh, scale of new build development on the site. One of the main objections to the previous application was the close proximity of plot one to Church Lane, and this plot has now been completely removed to allow the undeveloped character of the northern end of Church Lane to be maintained. Plot six has also been reduced in scale and height and moved back into the site, again maintaining the open character of Church Lane and allowing landscaping to be introduced to soften the appearance of this unit. This uh, design change has also ensured that the views of the parish church from Church Lane are not compromised. Changes to the eastern side of the site has also significantly improved the views of the church from the public footpath, and only one one and a half storey dwelling is now proposed, which is plot two, to help satisfy the parish council's wish for the site to be occupied by low rise development when they originally sought for this site to be allocated. The provision of a wildflower meadow on the PVAA to the east of the site will not only enhance the setting of the footpath and development site, but also improves environmental and biodiversity benefits of the scheme. The application includes the original and updated information on arboricultural and drainage matters, which confirms that the development can be carried out without compromising the important trees on the site. A revised drainage port has also been provided, which demonstrates the site can be suitably drained, and the applicants are agreeable to a pre-development condition to provide a detailed drainage scheme. Uh, the application fully addresses the two previous reasons for refusal and has sought to now provide a scheme which responds to the former agricultural character of the site and the applicants have worked closely with the council's professional advisors to satisfy both the technical and design elements of the scheme and deliver a policy compliant development which has an appropriate scale and character for this allocated site. I trust these comments are of assistance and you're able to support your officer's recommendation and approve the application. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have some questions of clarity for yourself, starting with Councillor Roberts, please, and then Hawkins. Thank you, Chairman, and through you, Chairman. Um, good afternoon, hello. Um, good afternoon, thank you for the presentation. Um, some of the concerns that have been um, put to us um, in the agenda um, are about the um, commercial um, building plan. And given the fact that uh, you've taken it down from two to one. I'd like to understand your um, reasoning of even keeping one on site. Um, and is it not actually somewhat in conflict with dwellings in a site like this to, to put a commercial um, office on site? So I, I would like to understand why you haven't just got rid of that altogether and made that barn into a dwelling and cut back on your um, new build. And you talked about um, retention of important trees. Um, I know this site, um, and I'll explain that later to the, to the committee, but um, it is tree-lined, is that road, and I 
gathered from the representation from the uh, residents that your intention is actually only to leave out of the maybe 40 odd two left um again can i have your uh, clarification about uh, why you think only two trees here are important thank you chairman well, so i think two questions there one about the retention of trees and two the justification for the commercial unit yeah, so the first question relating to the commercial unit really was um, in order to um, provide a, obviously a commercial element to the scheme with the move towards um, more uh, home-based working nowadays and um, the potential benefit of having uh, office space nearby to some of the new dwellings. Um, it is only a small scale um, office um, and in fact it complies with the policy of conversion and reuse of agricultural buildings for employment uses. Uh, with regard to the trees, um, I can answer some of these. John may want to, to contribute to those, but we followed the advice of the arboriculturalists and the trees that are due to be removed and scaled back are of low quality, low value trees. And we've sought to maintain any trees that are considered of an important value on the site. A lot of those trees have reached the end of their, of their basically of their life. But as you can see from the, the site layout plan, those, you can see the major trees that which are going to be retained, but also there's proposals to put significant trees on the edge of the PBAA to compensate for the loss of those um, aged trees and poor condition trees. Okay. If I could quickly, quickly come back on that. Um, however, um, changing the position of them is not going to uh, compensate for the fact of all those that are, are presently um, the entrance into uh, the village on that road, are they? You're just going to change the character very, very strongly. I don't think you have to come back on that, but I uh, don't think there's a question there. Um, Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and uh, through you. My question is on the drainage issue. I note from paragraph 28 that the sustainable drainage engineer actually objects um, on the basis that they're not convinced that infiltration sods is not suitable for the site. Um, and so they're not able to support what's been proposed by yourselves. And then we also have paragraph 161, which reinforces that because you've not actually explored sods in your report. Uh, why not? Yeah, I think uh, I'm not 100% certain how up to date some of the uh, comments within the report are, because we actually submitted a revised uh, drainage uh, report, which looked at both the issues of, of suds and surface water drainage. It actually has, has I mean, as the report officer has said, we've addressed the technical objections to drainage, but we are also obviously accepting a free development condition to make sure a very detailed drainage scheme is put in. I mean, we've got, in terms of suds, we've got um, infiltration underneath the highway itself. Um, we've also got, uh, there will be some drainage within to, into the actual existing uh, public uh, sewer system. But I think it's in terms of the, of the great grand conditions and what we're proposing, this site can, can drain in an appropriate manner. Do you want to come back? Yes, please, Chair. Um, when you say infiltration under the highway, which highway? The road in the site or the highway highway? <laughs> it's infiltration underneath the areas of hard standing. Right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Next speaker is Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. And through yourself, I'm just you know looking back at um, reasons you, you say they've been addressed, sorry, the agent says it's been addressed. But I just want to draw attention to policy S7, which was one of the key things um, in the refusal last time. Um, and 1B is the retention of the site in its present state does not form an essential part of the local character and development would protect and enhance local features of green space, landscape, ecology or historical importance. I'm just wondering, you know, given that was a, um, an important policy that was looked at last time, how, um, through yourself, Chair, you would you would justify the impact it's going to have on on where the trees are being removed and on that stretch of road? Um, how would you justify that? Thank you. 
Yep. I'm not sure if you can answer, but if you well, I think the as yeah. going back primarily to the um, to the tree issue, we followed the recommendations, advice of the arboriculture is that the trees that are being removed are of of low quality, um, and in a number of cases, um, in fact, dead. Councillor Williams. I, I use the trees to describe the stretch of road that has been referred to. I didn't ask about the trees themselves, Chair, just to clarify. But obviously, whether there is some trees, less trees, the whole point is beyond those, it is open. Um, that is the character of the road. So putting buildings and putting houses there, could you, can you justify um, how that would essentially... Um, its uh, development would not would would protect and enhance local features of green space and landscape. So I'm not talking about the removal of trees, chair, but how it enhances green space with the proposal. Sure. So I, I think the questions around the justification of how the, this development would enhance the area rather than detract from it. Well, the existing um, the existing buildings on site are, are dilapidated agricultural buildings um, and don't really de deliver any green space at all. So the scheme that's been designed has been um, designed to incorporate areas of public open space. There's two areas of public open space on the site within the scheme. And I think there's very much also within the street scene, particularly with moving uh, what was plot one and two, now plot one back away from the highway, it allows that for landscape existing and uh, augmented landscaping along the um, church lane uh, boundary to, to be retained and enhanced. Okay. Thank you for that. Councillor Ellington, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, for, uh, Dr Hawkins uh, asked the question I was going to ask. Okay, good. And Councillor Khan, please. Okay, so, so briefly, yeah, you know, there's been quite a lot of concern about the trees along, uh, along the road. I remember I visited the site uh, on the previous application and, and I, I agree that the, many of the trees along the road are not in good quality, but I want Obviously, if you clear them and then plant, it's going to be uh, slow to uh, the vegetation is going to be slow to be, uh, to to, um, to screen. Had you considered or had you discussed the possibility of coppicing them down to uh, ground level and allowing them to regrow, which would be much quicker and provide a much more rapid screen? Was that considered or discussed at all? So that's I mean that's that's an option which wasn't considered in the tree report, but it could be could be considered via a suitably worded uh, pre-development condition. Okay, thank you very much. And finally, Councillor Harvey, please. Um, yes, I, I sort of know the street very well. Um, I think it's a shame that the, the scale of the, the gable end that we saw um, in the uh, resident uh, presentation there seems to sort of destroy the, the notion of, of a sort of courtyard, which is rather sort of charming at the moment. And I, Accept that the scale of that gable end has been reduced and it's been set back a bit, but I'm not sure that um, it's actually been dealt with sufficiently, um, given that that was a sort of major is, is there a question item in, in the original refusal. Is there a question? Um, well, have they looked at um, doing something a bit more radical than um, just... Yeah, I think, a, I think a, it's a pretty points to the debate rather than questions for our, uh, our guests. Um, but thank you very much. Okay, members, I think those are all the questions we have. So thank you, gentlemen, for, for coming in and speaking to us this morning. We will now take our next public speaker who's representing the Parish Council and I believe is joining us online, Richard Smith. Richard, are you with us? Yeah. Yeah, great. We can see and hear you. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, before we kick off, can I just confirm with you that you have the permission of the Parish Council to represent them here today? Yes, I, I do indeed. I can confirm that. Good. Thank you very much. Well, as with all the public speakers, you'll have three minutes to present the Parish Council's views to us. And then if you could hold on the line in case there are any questions from committee members for you. So if you could... Uh, yeah, I see we've got a presentation on the screen as well, which I've been right. talking to. So yeah, when, whenever you're ready, please... Okay, fine. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm Richard Smith, speaking on behalf of Little Abington Parish Council to set out some of the reasons for our objecting to the present proposed development of Bancroft Farm. To make the council's position clear, 
we believe that this currently untidy site should be sympathetically developed. The council supports the proposition that an appropriate number of homes, including some that would meet the village's recognized need for downsizing properties, should be located on it. We did not identify and are unaware of any need for offices, which we fear may lead to potentially dangerous parking on what is now planned to become the Linton Greenway. Indeed, our council recently recommended approval for conversion of an existing office building in the village back to residential use. Our principal concern, reflected in many comments from Little Abington residents, is the impact of this scheme on the tranquil rural character of Church Lane, shown in my first slide. We feel this is still an overly dominant form of development in the conservation area, where the dwelling layout, access road, carports and pavement, and the loss of trees will destroy the current tree-lined vista. This was one of the principal reasons that the planning committee refused permission for the previous plans, and even after further iteration, the present submission does not address this fundamental objection. With the current emphasis on a sustaining and indeed enhancing bio biodiversity and tree cover, the grounds for objection are stronger. The proposed layout of the Bancroft site is quite out of character with the present housing on the west side of Church Lane, where the houses with their own driveways are set well back from the road behind a line of trees, which has been in place since 1803. The rural character and sense of tranquility of this little Abington Lane are a priceless asset that must be preserved. My second slide is a visualisation of what is planned, showing the harm that will be done. In the executive summary, in considering impact of the latest revisions on the conservation area, concludes, quote, not sufficiently harmful to warrant refusal. These words are repeated in para 228. We feel that the recognition of a harmful effect should be an immediate reason for refusal. Other salient matters are the disputed intrusion into the PVAA and surface water drainage problems on the Church Lane corner, to which we've repeatedly drawn attention. And the executive summary also includes an objection from the drainage engineer. Conclusions about impact on the conservation area in some instances do come down to opinion. The Parish Council asks you to trust that we, the Parish Council, are the most able to identify the best interests of our parish and therefore ask you to reject this application. Thank you. Richard, thank you very much for, for your comments and for the pictures. They're very helpful. Um, members, do you have any questions of clarification for the Parish Councillor? Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you, thank you, Mr. Smith, for that presentation. Did I hear you correctly that there's been offices in the village converted to residential? Yes, you did. So, presumably, as you rightly pointed out, there seems to be no need for office space. Well, I none that which we, of which we are aware. How big was this office? Uh, it, it was a, 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 a whole house that uh, was being used for uh, offices. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't put a square meterage on it, I'm sorry. No, that's, that's fine, that's fine, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Members, any further questions? Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's Councillor Smith. Thank you very much for your presentation, which I found very useful. Um, you will have heard the uh, agents talking about the, the quality of the um, trees um, that are um, planned to be um, dug up uh, and got rid of. Um, what's your feeling about the parish's council view as to that tree belt and its importance to the character of the lane, please? Well, we, we see it as extremely important, and that, that is why we've consistently pressed for a different form of scheme which would, would retain that belt of trees and set the houses behind it, probably all with their own individual access to the road. Uh, it, it's, 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 I agree that some of the trees are reaching the end of their lives, but 
how how that is dealt with could be a much more sympathetic uh, approach uh, in terms of preserving the vista along Church Lane. Thank you very much for that. So can I just say that you, you would think that some trees could come out, but actually they could be then replaced by new trees to continue that sort of character and view. Exactly, that, that would do it, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't think there are any more questions, so it just leads me to say thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, Richard, and thanks for holding on all morning. Appreciate it. It's uh, quite a patient job trying to wait for your turn to speak, so uh, and thank you very much for joining us and giving us your thoughts today. I finished the crossword while I was here. <laughs> Hopefully that took less than four hours. But yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much anyway. Okay. We now go to the local, one of the local members who wishes to address us, Councillor John Batchelor. Councillor Batchelor, are you with us? I am. Do we... I'm not. No, hang on. I'm trying do, to get the... Uh, do we have a video? <laughs> Right. I believe I'm with you. Okay, yeah, we can see and hear you. So obviously right. you're, you're one of the local members for Linton, myself being the other. Um, if you, I'm certain you know the procedure by now. Three minutes, yes, to, uh, three minutes to address us, please. And then if you'd hold on for any questions of clarification from the committee. So whenever you're ready, please. Right, thanks very much. Afternoon. Everybody, um, this is a fairly simple matter that comes down um, to um, a, um, an issue of balance. How you feel the balance is, particularly in in the context of the conservation area and um, the heritage assets. As we already just heard from the um, parish council. Um, they are in favour of actually developing this site. But uh, I think we're getting closer to what would be acceptable, but we're not quite there yet. So this all revolves around plots one and plots six. Uh, plot one, as we already heard, um, still encroaches on the PVAA. So Perhaps we, have, we will have some clarification on that shortly. Um, equally, plot one uh, um, is, is a concern to the tree officer, and it's very difficult to see how the tree officer's concerns can be addressed without actually moving uh, the building on plot one. Uh, but plot six is the real issue um, as far as um, the heritage conservation issues are concerned. Uh, and it's very difficult to see that as long as plot six is there, that this um, project could go ahead. Um, as has already been mentioned in the report, where the reasons for, the, for accepting plot six were that there wasn't sufficient harm um, to warrant refusal. Well, the bar for this policy is much higher than insufficient harm. It says precisely that we, it needs, any project needs to preserve and enhance. That's uh, policy NH14. This certainly doesn't do that uh, and, and until such time as the design of this uh, project does meet NH14, then uh, I would urge you to continue to refuse. Thank you very much. Great, thank you for those comments. Um, members, do you have any questions of clarification for the local member? Councillor Williams, please. Thank you. Um, through yourself, Chair, to, from one, through Councillor Bachelor to Councillor Bachelor. Um, can I just say that one of the comments was made by um, one of the public speakers was about it being less than one metre, uh, some sort of improvement in that. Are you able to give any more clarification around that section, potentially? I'm afraid the, um, the younger Councillor Batcher 
crept across before I managed to get my question out earlier. <laughs> so, so which plot are you referring to? Um, it was referenced earlier that um, there had been movement from the boundary, but it was a less than a metre movement. Oh, well, that is plot six. Yeah, indeed. Um, so plot, plot six is essentially in the same place. Um, it, it's actually longer, but not quite so high. Um, you know, it, in, in terms of the, the heritage asset and, and how that's all being judged, that simply doesn't meet. Um, the requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and through you, thanks, um, Councillor Bachelor. Um, you mentioned, or you focused on plots one and six, um, and then you said you can't see this project going ahead with plot six being there. Is that plot six being there? in the first place, or plus six being changed somehow? No, I mean, there's too many um, buildings on the site. Uh -huh. you know, it, and, you know, this is the one that is so significantly um, contributing to the massing on, on the roadside. Uh, in my view, um, you know, that needs to disappear altogether. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, plot one, you referred to concern by the tree officer. Is this to yep. do with the fact that uh, it says the proximity of T7 to the new had standing associated with plot one? Is that what you're referring to? It is indeed, and yep. uh, you know, the disturbance to the root, the roots of the trees with the um, um, the current proposal as far as drainage is concerned. Okay, thank you. And the, fa and the fact it's hard standing over yeah. about 25% of the root crop. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, question for you from Councillor Fain, please. <coughs> thank you, Councillor Bachelor. You, you make the point that plot one still encroaches on the PVAA. Um, now, that wasn't my understanding from the report, paragraph 31, or indeed I think from the presentation on behalf of the developers. Are you saying that's a significant encroachment? I wonder whether it actually might be helpful, because I think this is a crucial point, to, to see the, um, the, the plan, um, to see to what extent this does encroach on the PVAA, or are you saying it really affects the PVAA? Yeah. I think we're just going to throw it back to the case officer for that one. Yeah, well, it's already been raised by Mrs. Smith uh, earlier, so it isn't a straight line. It's shown as a straight line currently, but it isn't, so it's still actually uh, being part of plot one's garden, is my understanding. Okay, I mean, I'm sure we can get some more clarity with a map around that in, during the debate. Yeah. <clears throat> Unless you want to do it now, Michael? Okay, I think if we pull the map up, you disappear, Councillor Bachelor. So I think we're going to hold off right. on that for the debate, <laughs> um, yeah. which I think we're nearing, to be honest. Are there any more questions of clarity for uh, from Councillor Bachelor? No. Okay. So thank you very much for joining us, um, okay. and we will move on to the debate now. Also, I should also say I'm the other local member, but I'm I'm saving my comments for the debate, so uh, I won't be making any specifically as a local member. Councillor Daunton. Before we move to the debate, could we see um, the two diagrams again, please? And we've heard a lot about plot one and plot six. Maybe we could have them on the yep, screen. Yep, that should be okay. Michael, is that possible to show? Yeah. And perhaps a map showing the PVAA area as well, as that's obviously been raised a few times. So it might be worth highlighting the areas that have been discussed so far. Yeah, so um, plots, in terms of plots one and six, you can see the, previously there was plots one and two 
I think I can use my pen, actually. This was a previous proposal, which had two plots on the west, uh, northern boundary of the site, um, bringing a built form of development and a, a larger built form close to the edge of the site. Uh, now you've got just plot one set further away and you've got more landscaping on that western boundary. Um, plot six um, is in a, a similar position. It has been set away from the boundary, 600, 800 mil, and it has been reduced in height by around half a metre. And it's much more comparable in terms of ridge height to the existing barn on plot five. There's only, a, a, again, a four or five hundred mil difference between the ridge of the existing building and of plot six. I think the question was around how far back the new site is, the, the new plot is set back from the road. I think there was a question around that during the questioning. Yeah, I think the, the boundary where, where the dot is is about 0 0.6, 0 0.7, um, okay. 0.7 metres. Okay, and then the question around the PBAA. Obviously, we're told the PVA isn't a dead straight line, so some of the yeah. garden one does encroach. Um, so this, apologies, is going to require me to jump around various screens. So this is um, the council's internal mapping system with uh, various spatial constraints. Um, the purple, uh, solid purple area is the PVAA. Um, the red line here is the application boundary. I've done a measurement from a corner uh, here to the edge of the, how sort of to work out that width of the PVA and it's about 38 meters. Um, and if I now take you to a site plan. I've drawn the same line from the point here to the edge of the site. Um, the plan, for some reason, isn't scaling properly. It's saying 76, but it is also 38 metres. Okay. It well, seems to have doubled it. Well, so. we'll have to take your word on that, I'm afraid, That's, given the fact it said 76 on the screen. Yeah, there's no, there's no defined line, I think, on the ground of where the PVAA is. There's no clear demarcation. So mm. where there may be a degree of discrepancy in terms of overlap, it would probably be a matter of, of centimetres, depending on how the application boundary is plotted, because there's no discernible feature on site that clearly defines the... Um, boundary of the PVA at this at this point. Sure. Um, but from the measurements that I can do on the plan submitted and the, the internal mapping system, as I've just displayed, officers are satisfied that it, it abuts. If, if anything, it's a matter of centimetres at, at worst. Okay. So that's helpful. All right. Well, I suppose that's a, something for members to, to consider. Obviously, you know, we've heard the officer's view on that. Um, and obviously, we've heard the parish and local residents' view on that to the contrary. Um, members, into the debate now. Does anyone wish to raise any points or any further questions? Councillor Williams. Thank you. It was just, if we could see again, because um, what's been referenced is the sort of tree vista on that road. There was a um, sort of photo where the buildings were sort of superimposed onto it. I think it might be useful to just bring that back to have that clear in our minds, given it's been raised by residents. Um, then I'll happily give my comments. <coughs> No, the one where it's sort of sketched out, so we, we photo how it actually looks now. Oh, I think the one we're drawing on was yeah. made by the yes. parish and local residents, so I don't think... Yeah, so we're not allowed to bring that back? No? I, I no, don't I think so. That's what I'm asking. Okay, so we're not allowed to... That was, it was very useful. Um, if you can imagine we had, if you can make your comments based on that. Yes, okay, because I was going to sort of explain what I was saying. Um, okay, so um, I think there has been, you know, there has been changes made. There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, but I, I don't think it's really addressed fully our concerns. And I think particularly that moving back, you know, um, 0 0.6 metres or two foot for Councillor Roberts, because um, I have to work in the Imperial. Um, <laughs> I refuse to be metric. Um, is, uh, you know, it's... I. It's definitely not what I had in mind of a significant improvement. Um, and um, whether the, yeah, the encroachment on the PVAA, that seems to be, you know, I think we could, we could debate that probably for three, four days as to where that actually lines. But I do think this sort of street scene and the way things look at the moment and, and the trees and everything, and I appreciate that, that you know, trees, they do, they, they die, they need removing. Um, but sort of, it does feel like by putting that 
that plot so far on the road, you are changing the character of, of what's been referred to as a vista. And I referenced um, policy S7 because that was, a, that was a real key point I felt in the original application. Um, and you know that's something that needed to get addressed. Um, and I, you know, I've, I think I've given sufficient time to, for people to sort of give their arguments. But for me, um, that that has not been met. Um, and I think I, I do agree as well. The, the changes to plot one on on the left. Um, yes, we've gone down a building, but all we've got really is very similar floor print just it's one dwelling that's bigger rather than actually removing a dwelling in my mind you know the the change in actual floor space being used is is quite um yes yeah, so i'm looking to the left of there okay it's not it's not quite as much but actually when you look it's more towards the left and there isn't it's not it's not a great deal of change to be honest um so i don't think that they've gone far enough to alleviate my concerns I had previously. Um, so for myself, the reasons for refusal are the same before. You know, it's a planning balance. A lot has been said about, um, you know, the, the history, but actually it was recommended approval last time and as committee we refused it then. You know, it has gone to appeal certain times. So it's obviously a, a sensitive site um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think they, they really need to make significant changes to, to the impact it has on Church Lane. And I don't think by you know, a couple of foot either way, it's, that's enough. So, so I'll be voting to refuse. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, our next speaker is Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you and through you, Chairman. Um, when I first got married, 40 odd years ago, uh, my parents-in-law lived in Abington, and when we had our first baby boy, um, my mother-in-law used to, and I used to walk down this road, and at that time, it was actually a little working farm, and it was a bit like the Darling Buds of May. It was always a bit untidy, but that was, and I'll use the word that Councillor Khan used, it was part of its charm. It was charming, and my little boy used to love going down there and tickling the piglets' uh, noses as they came to the gates. Um, so I, I remember what it was like, and, and I'm really pleased to see that actually, in reality, though it's no longer a working farm, it's still uh, got that openness, that rural feel. And I think it's really important to remember that literally just beyond it is the village church. And so it's part of that old world character of the village which we are losing um, very rapidly across the country so anything that goes to replace it and it's quite clear that the um, the people of the village and the parish council are, are not being nimbies here they're not against something they, they realize that it's, it's a site that can be um, used but we have to remember that policy which um, councillor senior bachelor um, put to us that because it's in the conservation area and it's got these important buildings near it, it either has to enhance or preserve. That's what we state. That it's a policy commitment. Now this is in its present form again neither enhancing nor preserving. I believe that Councillor John Batchelor had it spot on. There's literally too many on here. And I can't understand the commercial side of it either. That seems to me to be Putting a commercial um, building into it or using one for a commercial premises is actually quite conflicting uh, with actually then having this development of housing. It doesn't appear from the reports of the parish council that it's a requirement that there's a, a demand in the village for it, especially if um, an office has already got now permission to be changed to a dwelling. I mean, there's just obviously no, and I think in the report it also mentions that nearby in other bigger areas, there, there, there are um, commercial enterprise areas that are free to be used. So I, I can't understand that, but I'm, I think it's quite unnecessary. This needs working on still. Um, when you walk down that road towards the church, it's really still got that joy of being rural 
And I think that bringing these buildings right up to that uh, scene, uh, the, to the road itself, and changes the character, changes the scenic value. Um, it, it, it can be changed, but not to this extent. So I, I hope that we will refuse it. I shall be um, uh, putting forward for a refusal. I think we've got good planning reasons for, especially based under the need to enhance and preserve. I think that says it all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for those, those views. Um, our next speaker is Councillor Khan, please. <coughs> I tend to take a different view from the views expressed up to now. Uh, um, but there again, I rather well, took a different view last time um, the application was made. I, I, I actually think I'm rather sorry that the building was moved back from the road. Uh, I felt it continued the feeling of the existing barn building uh, to take it uh, and made it uh, longer. Uh, and I felt it was actually a, a good solution for the thing. But it's only been moved back half a metre. I'm glad that it's not been moved back too much. I think it continue, it, that will retain some of the, that benefit. In terms of whether it was uh, uh, enhanced, I actually feel it does. I mean, I, I take the view that these are interesting buildings, that the area, the protected village community area, is in fact surrounded by development. It's an area within enclosed, uh, enclosed open area, and having building, um, dwellings around it is not in itself something that's a problem. The problem is whether they're, then they're acceptable dwellings to be seen from the area. Uh, and these are continuing the uh, rural theme, uh, the barn theme, and I think that's an interesting idea. Um, I'm not worried. In terms of the office, I don't think we can determine whether there is a demand. I don't think that's a reasonable reason to, to say no. Um, uh, 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 it's, we are in a position where behaviour in this is changing. Uh, having a small office will show to us whether there is now going to be a demand for, for uh, offices closer to home. Uh, I don't think really that's a reason that we could say, uh, refuse it. Uh, 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 and it seems to be, as expressed, uh, a useful reuse of an agricultural building which is in compliant with policy. So. Um, I actually feel that they will add some in interest to the uh, views from the protected village community area, and therefore I am actually in favour, and I shall be voting in favour. Yeah, I think Mr. Blaisby would like to come in. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just to um, remind members of the, the duty under paragraph 202 of the NPPF, um, that if you are identifying harm to the conservation area that you need to balance that against the public benefits that the proposal will bring. So I just, I ask you to just build that into your considerations during the debate. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Hawkins, please. Just to take the point that um, Mr. Blisby has just um, said, I'm trying to balance the loss of those trees with potentially what the benefits could be, which is what housing, or is it housing that's appropriate to that site? For me, it's the question. Um, we, we do tend to get attacked on, yeah, you're agreeing to your core, but you're allowing trees to be removed. People don't understand that some trees have uh, good quality and some are not, or they see our trees being removed and we can't replace like for like immediately. So you have that perception of destroying biodiversity. And we've talked, about a lot of, talked a lot about that this morning. Um, and what do we get for it? I don't know, on this one, I'm, I'm, I'm still vacillating to be honest. <laughs> it's, uh, there is benefit in the housing. I don't quite see why there still is an office building there, although I do take the point that people wanted to work from home. Perhaps um, it's the configuration of what's there now, I think that needs to change, making available for those who might want to in the buildings that remain, space to work from home. So um, yeah, not quite there yet, I think, is my view. Thank you. Councillor Fain, please. Thank you, Chair. Well, we considered a very similar application a year ago. We set out two specific reasons for refusal. The harm to the PVAA by virtue of encroachment and the harm to the character of the conservation area. 
and the setting of the Church of St. Mary. Now the question, it seems to me, is whether those concerns have been addressed, as the officer makes very clear in paragraph four that they have. Um, dealing first with the harm to the PVAA, I am satisfied that so far as it can be established, this site effectively does not overlap with the PVAA. Of course, there are other ways it might do harm, but I don't see that is the case. As Councillor Khan said, the PVAA in this case is surrounded by other developments, or not entirely surrounded, but has other developments close by. The second issue was the harm to the character of the conservation area. And I do take uh, Mr. Blaisby's advice on this, but the conservation officer uh, considered this and was quite clear that taking the points he outlines on page 77 into account, this proposal will not harm the character of the conservation area or the setting of St. Mary's Church. I haven't heard anything today that would make me come to a different conclusion on that. Then, as to the character of the development, clearly the, 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 the change from two dwellings to one, what is now plot one, uh, does have an, uh, an effect, including on the frontage. It enables the hedgerow to be continued at that point. Um, the question of whether the move of plot six by 0.6 metres is significant. I don't regard that as a matter for refusal. Indeed, there might be some who take the view that, that uh, it should have been moved further, some who think it might have been better kept on the same point. I don't think we can treat that as a matter of refusal. I'm very conscious of what the parish council said about the nature of the development. But I really think that this is a former farmyard, as was described by Councillor Roberts in particular, and it would be difficult, particularly given the depth of the site, to see that it could be set back, the houses could be set back in the way that the parish council were suggesting, and that in fact a courtyard approach might well be more appropriate to the retention of the character of this site. And lastly, on the question of the inclusion of just one actually very small office, um, I don't think that we should superimpose our own commercial judgment on the, that of the applicants. If the applicants feel, and they have presumably tested the market on this, that there is a market for offices, then that would satisfy me. But moreover, I think we have to accept, and this is accepted in our own existing policy, that there is demand for offices to be closely located to houses, and that some of the residents of those houses may indeed want to be able to work, not necessarily from home, but from very close to home without the need to travel. And that in, can enhance the sustainability of the village as a whole. The last question I come to is that of the trees. Uh, I don't find the tree officers um, information on this entirely uh, satisfactory as to whether any valid trees, any worthwhile trees are being removed here, but I do take the, the knowledge of um, both uh, Mr. Goodrums and Mr. Jennings on this point, that the trees to be removed are um, either at the end of their life or in some cases dead, and that the two key trees that we saw when we visited are to be protected. On a matter of principle at the end of this, if we consider an application and give reasons why we refuse it, and those reasons are then taken into account by the applicants who come forward with a new scheme, I would be very wary of then refusing that new scheme. There is a limit to how many bites of the cherry we as a planning committee and as a council can expect to have. We will not always be entirely satisfied. We will not always come up with a scheme that entirely meets what we might have envisaged or indeed what the parish council might have preferred. But we have to accept that in this case, the applicants have made a genuine attempt to take account of our previous concerns and have met that in the new proposal, which I would suggest we should now approve. 
Thank you for those comments. Uh, Councillor Roberts, you wish to come in? I'd just quickly come in on, that, on, on, on what Councillor Payne's just been saying. Yes, quite clearly, um, we can refuse and have a number of refusals about something if it isn't right. But also, it is, there is an onus upon the, the applicants to take on board uh, what the committee concerns are and the parish concerns are um, and you know therefore I, I don't think it's unreasonable um, if we refuse today it, it's a second refusal but it isn't a categoric we ain't having anything on this site it's just saying you're not there yet and it's up to you as an applicant to get there and satisfy because we, we know what we want um, and it, at the moment it isn't been actually offered to us and so I think you have to, have to remember that. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. I'm going to throw to Mr Sexton. I think he wants to come in on the tree issue. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to draw to members' attention condition H. Uh, it's a pre-commencement condition requiring full details of hard and soft landscaping. So the plans that you've seen up on screen do indicate you can get a good landscape buffer along the site. Those details aren't fixed and we've heard from members and I believe also the parish council um, the potential for planting of new trees. So there is a condition on there that it is pre-commencement because clearly the frontage of the site is very important. So that's why I've got that pre-commencement trigger. Um, so landscaping details are to follow. And I'm sure, obviously, the applicant and an agent listening, that the, the planting of tree, new trees in place of those that are currently of a, a poorer quality could be incorporated at that later stage, in that detailed stage, just if that's any help with members considering the, the change to the frontage of the site. Thank you, Chair. Okay. No, I think that's helpful. Thank you, Michael. Councillor Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. And, um, and we were rightly reminded about the balance of public benefit by Mr. Blaisby, although I have to say that hasn't changed my, my view. But um, so I think it is important we're clear on that. So I'm looking back as well. And what Councillor Fain said is completely right. You know, we, we refused it on two grounds and we should look at those and see what the changes have been. I do agree with the PVAA, as I said in my when I first spoke, you know, we can debate about that and where the line is drawn. And I think that might have been feet, actually, rather than metres, and that might be why the, the numbers were different, maybe. But, um, but it's one of those things that, yeah, that, that is very much, you know, these things aren't, aren't like, you know, there isn't a fence that goes along and says. But on the second point, um, about the sort of enhancement and preservation of character and heritage impact, looking at particularly NH14 and S7. Um, I think when you look at the other properties along that road, they are set back. And I think that in itself gives that approach to the church and it gives that heritage and, and the character of, of that area. So I think, I, I believe that you could resolve this. Um, I think there is an easy, easy solution. But what I've got in front of me, when I'm thinking of the public benefit of, of what potentially this gives, it gives us five dwellings, okay? Five dwellings when we've got a local plan. So five market dwellings can be achieved anywhere. So why here? Um, you know, what is the additional public benefit of having five market dwellings in this location? Um, I don't think that that public benefit outweighs the issue to the character, because I think you could easily have four. Um, it's, it's this, it is this plot six, which is the problem. And I think if that was, as Councillor John Batcher said, you know, that one property is actually blocking the whole thing because if that wasn't so close, yeah, you know, we're talking 60 centimetres is this, you know, we're, we're not talking about anything. I, I, I'm not going to make comments about, you know, perceptions of, of size, but essentially it's about this. Um, that's not very significant. And I, and I agree that you can't, you probably can't move it. And so it probably does need to go. If this had been affordable housing, then I think the balance would have been different because we do have an identified need for affordable housing in this location. Um, but market housing can easily be be anywhere in the district or neighbouring areas. I, I don't have an issue with, with the office. 
Um, I think it's brave, given you've got Grant a Park right next door and everything that that brings, but you know, the commercial market will deal with that. That's not a consideration for us. Um, but yeah, so I hope that that shows where I am, that I am taking that balance into account when I give that view. Um, and that um, I do also think that it can be achieved, but the reason too, and I'm looking at the minutes of the previous one here, trying to make sure on consistency, you know, we did say that it rode the relatively undeveloped nature of the application site and its rural qualities, which contributes positively to the existing character of the conservation area. And it cited um, plots one and six, uh, would represent an overly dominant and prominent form of development. That, that was the key there that we were looking at. And when I look at those, that plot, plot six to myself, plot one, you know, it's been changed. I think if it was just that alone, um, then it'd be a, an approval from myself. But plot six, I do still believe overly dominant and would be too prominent in its location, given the character of everything else around. So for myself, that's that second um, bit does still stand. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, members, I'm going to give you the benefit of my views now, albeit very briefly, because a lot of the points have already been said, and I'm not one for repeating points that have been made. Um, so I'm just looking at the reasons for refusal last time, of which there were two. One that's been mentioned was the encroachment into the PBAA, which for me, I appreciate there's some debate about whether it fully is still encroaching or not. But as there is some ambiguity there, I don't see that we could refuse it on that particular point. Um, point two, which is the impact on the conservation area and also the list, the grade two listed building, which is the church just at the end of uh, church, church lane. Um, for me, um, I'm going back to the conservation officer's comments which they say the proposal will not harm the character of the conservation area or the setting. But I think if we go back to our policy, which is looking at, um, which looks at when we could uh, develop in the conservation area, and it would need to preserve or enhance, not just, uh, not just not harm. So for me, I don't see that that reason has been satisfactorily um, overcome. So for me, that main reason for refusal, in my view, would be that uh, the second reason, i.e., encroachment into the conservation area and impact on the local listed building has not been overcome. So for my view, um, I am still minded to vote refusal. Councillor Williams. Thank you. Um, and just to assist officers on what you've said there, I think reason two from the minutes completely still stands. Just, I would say it is now just plot six and it isn't plot one and six, yep. um, if that helps. I think it's been noted, thank you. Uh, members, any further points? Members wish to make on this? If not, I think we're at a point where we can take uh, make a decision on this. I don't see any, so I'm going to ask officers, should members be minded to refuse, if we could just rehearse the reasons for that that officers have heard so far? I'm looking at you here, Michael. So further to what Councillor Williams has just said, this is in effect the same reason as before, um, apart from I've removed plot one, um, as highlighted, so it's just now plot six. And as um, Nigel alluded to, just added a bit about public benefit because we're hearings officers that members don't feel that the public benefits outweigh the harm. Um, just on that, though, I would just stress that these are, you know, there are five single story properties being delivered as part of this site. Um, they're, they're market dwellings, and there is a emphasis within the local plan about the need for those smaller properties so just so members have that in their mind in balancing as well this is an opportunity to have five single story properties within a village was, was that the one reason i did hear some others as we we're going through the uh, through the debate um i think out of character with the street scene was one policy s7 i think i did hear at one point Uh, when the reason here talks about impact on the street scene, it just doesn't reference policy S7. It refers to policies HQ1 and then H4 in, in that regard in terms of our design and our heritage policies. Okay, but the street scene is referenced in this character heritage impact uh, reason. Yes, the existing character conservation area. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I can tweak this so that we do have that, that reference. Yeah, I think that'd be handy. I think that was raised during the debate. So I think it'd be handy to include. Um, members, were there, were there any other reasons that we felt should be included? Councillor Daunton? Well, no, I think it's just a, an addition to that. It, it's not just the sighting of Plot 6. It's the fact that it, it, the, the way it faces onto the street. The, yeah, it's the dominance. Thank you. That's what I was seeking, the dominance. Michael, I don't know if that can be incorporated somehow as well. Do you like the sighting and orientation? So you're asking for the sighting and orientation of plot six? Sure. Okay. But, I mean, in terms of other um, material reasons for refusal, obviously we have the character heritage impact, which I think incorporates everything we've said so far. Do members feel there's anything else that we need to include at this stage, or is that sufficient? I think, okay, I think that that is uh, the reasons for refusal. Officers, I'm just looking at you. Are we content with those? Yeah, I think if, as again, we could just agree to confirm with the chair, because I've just yeah. obviously made yeah. a couple of notes. Sorry, I'm stepping Okay, okay. Um, all right, we have a rehearsed reason for refusal based on the comments from the committee. Uh, members, we are going to be split on this, I think, so we do need to take an electronic vote. So, Aaron, if you could set that up for us, please. So, members, as usual, press the blue button to register. Uh, green, if you wish to approve the application. Red, if you wish to refuse. And yellow, to abstain. So, one more to vote. <laughs> and I... No, that's it. We've, I've, I've got 11 on my screen. Okay, I think, I think we're there now. We have 11 votes on the table, which people can see on the screen up here. So we have two votes in favour, eight votes against, and one abstention. So therefore, the application is refused. Okie dokie. Thank you very much to everyone that took part in that. Um, members, it's half one. I've worked up an appetite. So I think we're going to stop uh, for half an hour. And if we will come back and hopefully complete the agenda at two o'clock. So thank you, everyone. See you in half an hour.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to this meeting of South Cam's District Council's Planning Committee. We're just coming back after the lunch break, and we are going on to agenda item seven. Uh, the application is at the former cement, cement works and quarry, Hazenfield Road, Barrington. The proposal is for a modification of planning obligations to a section 106 agreement for an already approved planning application. The applicant is Red Row South Midlands, um, and the applicant the application is brought to us oh, for, for quite a long reason. Um, <laughs> uh, they're essentially asked, looking to vary a condition on the, on the planning application regarding Section 106 payments. Um, the officer recommendation is approval, and the presenting officer is Mr. Sexton again, Michael. <laughs> so we'll pass back over to you then to uh, give us any updates and introduce the report, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, well, actually, there is, there is an update. Um, there in paragraph uh, 30, sorry, I misplaced my update note. <laughs> paragraph 30 of the report talks about um, a tra uh, traffic management payment. Um, it's just confirmed that that payment at the request of Barrington Parish Council has been, the second payment is being brought forward to prior to the occupation of the 50th dwelling rather than the 101st. So at the, as a following request on the Parish Council, the developer is happy to accommodate making that payment earlier. Um, so I will just, I've got a very short presentation. Why should I show my screen? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so this is a, a section 106A application. It's largely for members because of the, the wording um, of the approval of the outline consent um, and the particulars of the contributions which are attached in Appendix 1 of this report. But just for context, um, this is where the cement site is, similar site is in Barrington, on the northern edge of the site uh, of the village. Um, it's really it's all set out in the report. I just have extracted a few key points just to highlight to members. Um, one of the changes is that the education contribution um, is the same value, but it's being split into two separate contributions, one towards education and one to early years at the request of county. Um, the, there is a reduction in the financial contribution towards the installation and maintenance of real-time passenger information displays, but that's purely because the equipment is cheaper now than it was. Um, as stated in the update, uh, a trigger is being brought forward for a payment to the parish of traffic management. Um, public open space contribution is being deleted entirely because the land isn't being transferred to the parish council, so there's no point in that contribution being there. Um, and perhaps very important to highlight that uh, the healthcare contribution is being brought forward to prior to first occupation on May 2022. It was previously the 100th dwelling, so that's a real improvement to allow the expansion of Harston surgery, um, which Red Road again agreed to do. Um, this deed did start off life because of uh, some alterations to the footpath triggers which are set out in the report and on the slide that are being pushed back slightly due to the complexities of delivering footpath works. Um, just for context, the, the footpath link from the site to the station, as you can see, is a very extensive uh, route with lots of complexity. So that's now going to be prior to the 50th occupation rather than the first. And the other two uh, roads or paths are within the site itself, moving from the first to the 10th. Um, as a point of clarification from communication from the Parish Council, just to be clear, uh, paragraph 31 of my report sets out a summary of a contribution towards community facilities. Um, Barrington, pa uh, Barrington Parish Council, during the course of this process, has requested that there be provision for reasonable transfer of funds between the elements. Um, and that has been provided within paragraph 2.36 of the deed. So really this is just to show on the screen to members, um, particular 2.2 at the bottom that the 106 will enable more flexibility for the parish council. Um, so that's that's very welcome from their perspective. So that's effectively it. Um, we would just like members' agreement that we can move forward to uh, complete the deed. Um, there's no objections from it from any parties, and it's been in the pipeline for over two years now, so we're all very keen to get this over the line. That's it from me, Chair. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I think we do have one public speaker on this, and that is the agent for the applicant, Alice Kirkland. Ms. Kirkland, are you with us virtually? Hello, Chair. 
Hello, can you see me all right? Uh, yes, we can see and hear you fine. Thank you for joining us. Um, Alice, obviously the report's been presented by the officer Michael Sexton. Um, obviously, if there's anything you wish to add uh, to support the application, you have three minutes to do so. And then at the end, if you could just stay on the line in case there's any questions of clarification from the committee for yourself. So whenever you're ready, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, just by way of introduction, my name is Alice Kirkham and I'm speaking on behalf of Red Row Homes. Um, Red Row are the applicant for this item and the developer of the former cement works site in Barrington. Um, as this is not a standard application for development, I wasn't proposing to use the full three minutes to present to you, um, but I was keen to appear before you so as to be able to answer any questions that you may have. Um, safe to say, as applicants, we are in support of the application and the proposed changes to the Section 106 agreement contained within the draft deed of variation. Um, the changes bring a be benefits to a range of stakeholders, not just us as developer, but also the Parish Council, County Council and NHS. Um, a number of triggers for the payment of financial contributions have been moved forward, so that in total over half a million pounds will be paid earlier in the scheme's development than is provided for within the original agreement. Um, the case officer has set out the key issues within his committee report and the verbal update that you've just heard, so I have nothing more to add, but I am happy to take any questions from members if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And um, you've actually just reminded me, I probably need to declare that I'm a, a member of Cambridgeshire County Council who will be recipients of some of the funding. So I just do need to declare that. I think Councillor Dawson's probably going to do yes, the same. Yes, similarly, I should declare that I'm a member of Cambridgeshire Good. County Council. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for reminding me. Members, do I have any questions of clarity or just general questions about the application for Ms. Kirkham? Councillor Hawkins, please. Thank you, Chair. Through you, I'm not sure if this is for Ms. Kirkland or perhaps um, Michael. Paragraph 22, a contribution of, I don't know what that number is. Is it 2 million? Is it 204,000? If it's 204,000, it doesn't add up. If it's 2 million, it doesn't add up. I can, can I someone can. clarify, please? <laughs> I, I can respond to that through you, Chair, if that's okay. Um, that figure is lifted from the committee minutes. Um, so I think there was a typo in the committee minutes back in 2015, 2016, um, which I do clarify in paragraph 20, uh, 23, um, because everything within paragraph 22, A to G, reflects what's actually written within the 106 agreement. So I think it's a slight typo of the whatever figure that's trying to be. Come back. Yeah. Yeah, come Sorry, back. The number still doesn't add up, does it? I mean, A, B, C, D, E, but F, G adds to 535,000. Wait, well, where is that coming from? So, uh, I think the question is, is the first number in point 22, should the actual number be the sum of points A, B, C, D, E, F, G. <laughs> I think that was probably the intention. Let's say the figure quoted in paragraph 22 is a reflection of what was printed in the committee decisions. Um, I don't know if there's anything that Alice wanted to add. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, Red Row Homes weren't the applicant at that stage. The applicant oh. was um, Semex. <laughs> I can't um, honestly help to fill you in on um, on that discrepancy, um, other than to say that when Red Row purchased the site, it was um, on the basis of the uh, the figures contained within the Section 106 agreement itself, which um, Michael has outlined within the report. Um, but, um, it's just pure speculation, but we did think perhaps it might be the case of um, that the uh, works themselves were being included within a potential figure of up to two million. So um, that might account for, for the difference uh, because the works uh, in setting out the pedestrian cycleway to the station um, would sort of run to uh, certainly over a million pounds. So that might account for the for the missing figure. Thank you. I think that, that kind of answers the question because 535,000 is nowhere near the two million. I, I agree. So it's good to get some clarity on that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wilson, please. This is a, a very trivial question, but um, there are a couple of the um, changes uh, that are 
where the trigger point is going to be the 101st dwelling, whereas in the original um, agreement, it was the 100th dwelling. I'm just wondering what the significance of the extra one dwelling is. And Okay, I think we're, uh, Mr. Reid is volunteering to come back on that one. Um, if you actually looked at the original 106 agreement, usually the reference to 100th dwelling was following occupation of 100 dwellings, which means that it doesn't really work because following could be at 150 dwellings. So we've moved it to prior to the occupation of the 101st so that there is certainty. That means it follows the 100th dwelling, but you have the certainty of knowing that the 101st dwelling won't be occupied until the payment's been made. So it, it was a, a drafting point that we picked up. I hope that's helpful. Great, thank you very much. Um, Alice, I don't think there's any specific questions for you at the moment. We are going to go into the, the debate, though, so if you stay on the line in case there are any questions you can help with during that, during the debate. Yeah, no problem. Oh, and sorry, I've just been reminded, actually, um, I think we have Councillor van der Weyer, who's the local member on the line. Aidan, are you with us? Uh, yes, I am. Yes, I'm, I'm afraid I can't turn my camera on, but I am here. Sorry, what was that? Uh, I, 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 I can't turn my camera on, but I am here. Can you hear me? Uh, we, we can. You're quite faint. If you could try and speak a bit louder, I think that might help. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um, as I can. Okay, okay. So, I think all the committee members had received the... Um, uh, your written comments on this particular application via email this morning, um, but obviously you are here with us at the moment, so if you want to verbalise those for us, that'll be, that'll be very handy. As usual, three minutes, and then if there's any questions of clarity, um, I'll put them to you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Yes, I, I will be very brief. Um, I, I, do, I do support this, um, this revision of the 106 agreement, and I do, do hope we can approve it now. Um, uh, the report, the excellent report, which, um, sets out why we, the changes that are made and sort of explains what, why they're needed. Um, it, we, the uh, application was passed uh, nearly seven years ago, and obviously some things have changed on the ground. Um, these are very pragmatic uh, changes, as, as um, the applicant just described. Um, a lot of work has been done by uh, officers here, uh, Red Row Parish Council, um, uh, to get this uh, something that will work much better for the community in particular. I mean, this question of the flexibility that, that this allows um, uh, on the on the community work, I think, is is really significant. Um, uh, we're currently, uh, well, the parish council is leading the work on on uh, with the community on that, and um, that will allow us to to bring um, bring forward something that, that really benefits the community. Um, uh, yes, the, the the development is is uh, the first houses are, are pretty much ready for occupation, I believe, and um, uh, so I think we're we're all keen to get on and um, uh, start welcoming the new new residents um, uh, into the village. So I do hope we can um, we can support this and, and, and we can move on. Uh, just a, uh, yes, my recollection is that the um, uh, the uh, fund the amount stated for um, transport contributions included the uh, tr uh, the footpath link to uh, Foxton Station and, and the value of it was assigned to that of well over a million pounds and possibly the other footpaths as well, which explains that that discrepancy is my recollection. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Reid, I think you want to come back. Uh, it's a small point of detail, but just to assure members that under the terms of the original 106 agreement dating back to some years, uh, the, what the deed of variation uh, gives members comfort of is that the indexation on all of the figures mentioned in the deed of variation will likewise be indexed back to the date of the original agreement, so that indexation doesn't start from uh, this week or next week. It, it runs from the previous date, which is clearly critical because obviously we've got four years of indexation. Okay, thank you for that clarity. Um, okay, before we move to the debate, does anyone have any questions for the local member on this? No, I don't see any. So we'll move into the debate then, members, starting with Councillor Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to say that um, I think, it, as, as Councillor van der Ver said about it being pragmatic, it does seem pragmatic. Um, it's bringing forward, not back. If it was moving things back, I'd be hesitant or reducing the funds. But given it's um, bringing those funds earlier, I think it seems... Um, seems a sensible approach and it does have the support of 
I think nearly everybody, even I, my ward isn't so far from there, but even I've had people sort of saying, you know, we want to get this across the line. So um, uh, I think in, with that in mind, I'm quite happy to go to a vote chair and support it. Good, good. Um, members, do we need any further debate on this? Do anyone wish to raise any further points or give an opposite point of view? Councillor Hawkins? It's not an opposite point of view. <laughs> um, I just wanted some more information on the healthcare contribution. Um, it's a bit of a bugbear of mine. Um, you know, we ask, or the county asks for healthcare contributions, but we don't know where it's going. I know you've said it's Harston's surgery, but is that being extended now, or what's the plan for that? How soon can we see that? Thank you, Councillor. Um, paragraph 41, I think, of the report details that it, it is towards a scheme for a two-storey extension and internal remodelling to provide three additional consulting rooms, a uh, refurbished dispensary, an additional ancillary slash administrative space and reconfiguration improvements at the Harston surgery, which they're very keen to, to get on and, and do as soon as possible. Yes, well, they, the payments need to be made before either before May 2022 or... Uh, first occupation to allow those works to start in the immediate future, you know, as, as soon as possible. Okay. I guess uh, uh, my concern is, are they actually starting work? Has it started? I know that this, you know, it's, it, we expect this to happen by this time, but if they don't start kind of pretty soon, they're going to happen. Anyway. Okay, I think that's the question answered. Um, Councillor Williams is wondering about. I was going to ask her if she wished to propose we move to the vote. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's been proposed. And I think Councillor Fain has seconded a, a move to the vote. So, members, I think um, I haven't heard anyone say otherwise. So, can we take by affirmation that this is agreed? Agreed. Anyone against? Abstain? No, so that is unanimously agreed. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we're on to. The enforcement report starts on page 135 of the agenda, and it's agenda item 8. I think we have Mr Holloway on the line. Will, are you with us? You're with us, but you're muted. Can you see me? Yes, we can see and hear you well now. Thank you. Excellent. So if you'd like to present the report to us, please. Yep, so I have a few verbal updates for members. I shall start with Smithy Fan. Um, just to let you know that we have now formally agreed with Ivy Legal uh, for them to draft the planning contravention notice, notices to be served on the site. Um, I have a meeting with them within the next two weeks uh, to arrange this. The hope is that responses from these planning contravention notices will give the, our leadership group a, a fuller picture of the site um, and determine a course of action to move forward. So progress is happening. Um, so hopefully we can move it to the next stage rather quickly. Um, another case to update that's not on the committee report, uh, but will be added is Redhill Close in Great Shelford. Uh, this is a new development site that's reared its head recently. Um, we've had dialogue with the agent associated with it. Um, this has resulted in fencing being erected around the site um, and no more burning of waste has occurred since our intervention. The only issue that we have got with this site is that the approved construction method statement uh, goes against the actual conditions and that it and it has been approved. It states that no contract parking can take place on site uh, and also the loading and unloading of vehicles and deliveries has to be off site as well. So our hands are tied on that matter. Um, and also there has been a report of a hedge being removed uh, between Jesus College and the site. Um, this has been dealt with between both parties and they're happy to sort it out amicably between themselves. We have another site, uh, Pleasant View on Ely Road. This is a site with a dilapidated dwelling and several mobile homes on the site. Uh, there's been concern that it's been land raising that's caused to local drainage issues. This has led to Brian Heffernan from the LLFA going out on our behalf to inspect. Um, he is more than happy that there are, there are no more drainage matters that have been caused by the raising of the land. 
that the drainage on site should be satisfactory, but there are civil remedies open to the complainant in this matter to deal with it. We are dealing with a mobile home being removed from the site. Um, that should have happened. Um, unfortunately, I've been able to visit the site this week, uh, but I will be going next week to have a look to update and I'll provide a, a full update at the next committee. And then my final verbal update is, whilst I've got Councillor Roberts in the room, um, is the Swan uh, High Street in Foulmere. Um, I have served two listed building enforcement notices on the site. Um, it was last month, but obviously we're a month behind on the committees to update you. Uh, one is for the signage um, and one is for the internal makeup of the property. Um, that concludes my verbal updates. Uh, any, ready for any questions? If you are any. Thank you. I think we have a few questions on a few items, starting with Councillor Roberts, please. No, it's not a question, it's a compliment. Um, thank you very much. I was actually going to briefly bring it and ask. I know it's not, you know, in the big pictures of things, but it is in the conservation area, listed building. So thank you very much. I very much appreciate that. And if you could keep me up to date, thank you. Yeah, no worries, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, a few more questions for you, Will. Uh, first, from Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you. Um, I, I'm very pleased to see the progress on Smithy Fen, but I'm particularly pleased to note that consideration is being given to some of the needs of the residents of the site. I know from um, work I've been de doing with a couple of families on that site over the last year that there is some severe ill health, and which is compounded by the lack of literacy. And I'm very pleased that some input is going to be put into trying to overcome those obstacles that some of the residents on the site face. Thank you. Thank you for Thank that. You. Councillor Fain. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very grateful to Ms Holloway for bringing forward the Red Hill Close case, because I think I maybe made that request a little late and for the action that's been taken since. Um, I take the point that it is not possible for the contractors to park particularly low loaders and so on on site. One concern is that the conditions are that only small uh, equipment be used on site. Uh, and the reason that low loaders are there, sometimes four in a day blocking a very narrow close, um, is because they're using quite large um, JCBs and so on. Sorry, the other brands available, I don't remember quite which brands are being used on site, but uh, large earth movers. Um, now that's mostly, uh, that stage seems to have been completed, but there are still some large vehicles on site which will need removing by low loader. Will further, is there anything can be done to prevent uh, further large vehicles be, being brought in by low loader? Ultimately, the biggest answer, because of the construction method statement, the ultimate answer is no. However, obviously we're in discussions with the agent, so any concerns that we do have, we've got an open network with them now, um, so we can pass these concerns on. Um, they've worked with us so far since we, you know, since the commencement of the development and all the issues that um, happened immediately. Um, so please keep coming to us with any issues and any concerns, and we'll raise them directly to try and mitigate any issues on site. Thank you. And Councillor Harvey, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, just to note that um, I think I raised this um, a couple of sessions ago um, that uh, Cottage Farm Nursery appeared to have disappeared from the um, enforcement report. But, and I'm not sure whether it's now reappeared and re-disappeared or whether it is still uh, pending reinsertion. Yeah, so councillor, I, I did email you a couple of weeks ago to make contact with me because um, I need to discuss it with you privately. Um, I have discussed it with other members um, around the area. Um, so I'm more than happy to discuss this off off record because um, there are matters that are outside of planning enforcement. Okay, well, apologies for missing your email in that case. Um, <laughs> no, that's back not in touch. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, I think those are all the questions and comments for yourself at this stage. So thank you for holding on all day for us. And um, we'll no see you at the next meeting. Right, thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thanks, Will. Okay, members, we're on to final section.
which is agenda item nine, and that's an update on appeals and enforcement actions. So, Mr. Blaisby, please. Oh, thank you, Chair. So, I'm just going to um, very briefly outline the two Sawston appeal decisions that you'll see on page 145 and the over decision on page 146, um, mostly with regard to the five-year housing land supply position. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to, to Michael, who's not finished his work for the day, because um, I'm going to ask him to, to give you a, a presentation um, on the uh, appeal that was allowed at Stapleford. So on the, on the Sawston decisions, um, effectively, uh, there was a, a at the at the hearing. There was a consideration of our five-year housing land supply position, which we we maintained was 6.1 years, and which the appellants said was somewhere between 3.95 and 4.52 years. Um, but essentially, the inspector did not do. Uh, uh, he he didn't really undertake um, a detailed assessment of the arguments because he concluded that neither of the schemes. Um, would respect their local context or conserve or enhance the open countryside character or its surroundings um, and essentially found it inappropriate. Um, so they said, regardless of the five-year housing land supply position, um, there's enough harm there to dismiss the appeals. So it effectively didn't, uh, didn't address it. Whereas in the over appeal, the inspector did, um, and they were in the, in the appeal decision, the inspector assesses um, 20 sites that were debated at length, I understand, at, at the hearing, um, and concluded that of the 2,433 disputed um, uh, dwellings um, where the appellants were saying they would be unlikely to be delivered, the inspector said that he felt that there were 978 of those were unlikely to be delivered and should be excluded from the council's trajectory over the 26th period. So as a result, that, um, that left council with a 5.6 year supply in the inspector's view. But, but what is positive is that the inspector felt that because we have performed well, that it was appropriate to apply the 5% buffer and not the 20% buffer. So that, that was a, a positive. Um, the inspector went on to allow the appeal essentially because although um, he identified harm, um, yeah, and, and that the dwellings were contrary to um, local plan policies of outside the framework, etc. There was a um, football pitch coming forward as an extension to the recreation ground, and he gave great weight to that in his decision um, and allowed the appeal. So, if you, have you got any questions on those two? Councillor Roberts? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, Nigel, um, are we going to contest that figure? at all um, because obviously I think we all feel quite cushioned by 6.2 and more wary of 5.6 is there any way not in that appeal obviously but is there any way in which we can um, appeal to the minister um, I mean are we what do we in our hearts still feel do we feel that we've got 6.2 or do, do we, are we actually saying, yes, the inspector was right? I mean, I would just like a little bit of clarification of what our opinion of that decision was and are we going to fight it or, uh, you know, because obviously the, the nearer we get to that five mark, uh, the more pressure on us it becomes to start giving applications such as some of the ones that we've had today. Uh, I think for you, Chair, um, I think you'd have to go through the arguments for each of those 20 sites that the inspector raised and see you know, whether or not we find fault in those. And I think Mr. Reid wanted to say something on this point. Um, I was just going to um, add, Chair, if I may, that we did have council sitting alongside our planning team at the over appeal decision. And uh, following the appeal decision, we uh, have sent him a copy and asked him to advise as to whether we should be challenging and his advice is no, we should not challenge. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Chair. Um, to add to that, uh, 
officers are currently um, preparing and looking at the figures as we normally do uh, so that we can put together the um, figures for the 22 to 27 period. And one of the tasks with that is actually looking specifically at those sites that have been disputed um, with a view to you know, clarifying really what the situation is now, <laughs> not then, and whether or not we will be you know, uh, putting those in the, um, in the new figures. But we're expe expecting to publish that on the 1st of April, so the work is close. Okay. I think that's a useful update to have. Stephen? Um, again, just to advise members that uh, Council is uh, uh, helping ensure that the preparation of those figures is robust. Great. Um, oh, yes, sorry. Do you want to move on to the next application? Michael, down to you again, I'm afraid. Yeah, so if members can sit through another short presentation from me, I can do a Brief summary of the Stapleford Retirement Village uh, appeal. Um, so I've effectively just used my committee presentation and added a bit on and shortened it. But this was a, an outline application for a retirement village um, in the uh, in Stapleford, entirely within. I shared the wrong screen. Apologies. There we go. So just as a, a reminder, this was a site on the edge of Stableford for the retirement village and countryside park entirely within the green belt. And this was the illustrative master plan where you can see the retirement village um, nearest the edge of the village and then the 19 hectare countryside park to the north. Um, this was officer's recommendation to committee, we recommended refusal, which was unanimously endorsed. We identified harm in terms of inappropriate development in the green belt, loss of openness, encroachment, character, and landscape, which didn't outweigh the very special circumstances set out on the right. This went to an appeal inquiry, which lasted six or seven days, I think. Um, and the decision was allowed. Um, the inspector did agree that it, uh, the proposal had to be regarded as a single proposal and therefore constituted appropriate development and they did agree there would be an impact on openness. However, the inspector did conclude that there wouldn't be harm to character and landscape and in their decision sets out that in their view there's no reason it couldn't be come forward in a form that would be consistent with the village character. Um, so that removes some of the harm that we had identified. They did identify very minor harm to a scheduled ancient monument and weighed that against the public benefit. Um, a very interesting point coming out of the decision is the, the final bullet point where the inspector has highlighted uh, that despite the evidence base of the local plan, the council's approach to C2 housing has not delivered and is not expected to deliver special care housing in sufficient quantities, noting policy references for Ida Darwin and Campbell West, but that none has been delivered. Um, on that particular point, that's obviously being raised with the policy team, um, who will be considering that in, in full, I'm sure, in the emerging uh, next local plan. Uh, this is sort of a visual representation of how the inspector um, found the proposal in their view. So they'd only identify harm through inappropriateness and loss of openness. Um, gave significant weight to the unmet need and the, the benefits of the countryside park, as indeed we did as officers. Um, but by eliminating the, the harm to character and openness, um, you can kind of see how the inspector's view tipped the scales the other way and concluded that um, there were very special circumstances to outweigh the harm identified. So that's just a quick whistle stop tour. Oh, and just for reference, there are some sort of key conditions imposed. Um, conditions 17 and 18 restrict the occupation of the unit. So it is you know, it's a retirement care village as it's meant to be. Um, and the countryside park has been secured through a 106 agreement to ensure that that is also delivered along with the care village. 
that's it. That's it. Thank you very much for that, uh, that presentation. Members, do you have any questions around that particular presentation? Councillor Daunton and then Corbyn. Um, yes, um, uh, Michael, could you define um, the difference between a retirement village and special care housing? In my mind, those two things are not the same. I don't know if any officers can clarify that difference. I can. I had that on the slide in the original presentation, um, but I deleted it out of that one. So if you bear with me a second, I will open that up. So this was the context in my presentation to the committee um, that the retirement care village it, it comprises assisted living and extra care accommodation where you have different packages of um, assisted living needs and that's what sort of separates it from your traditional care home. Um, I have actually forgotten your original question though, I do apologise. <laughs> and maybe if I explain where I'm coming from. Um, it mentions the Ida Darwin site, obviously I'm very familiar with that. Um, that there was no provision for um, special care housing on the Ida Darwin site, but within easy walking distance, there is now being constructed a 72 bed care home. Um, so, you know, the, I, I see the relationship of those to be very close. My understanding of a retirement village is not a care home, it's a completely different thing. You might have within a retirement village some special areas where people can move into. Uh, care facilities, but a retirement home, um, you know, as it says on the tin, it's for over 55. I'm sorry, but I'm considerably more than that, so I'm not near a retirement home. Yeah, so when we, we looked at the need, um, and I think even the evidence that was put forward by the developer that's on the application did conclude that in terms of care home, the traditional care home, we were, the district was more or less meeting the projected need, assuming all the development came forward. But there was a real lack of the assisted living and extra care accommodation within the within the district. So that's that's where the real strong demand has come from. Um, and and we as we accept as a council, we haven't met the need for assisted living. Um, but care homes, is, if everything came forward, we would just about meet it. Um, I'm not sure I've really got a conclusive answer for you. So it's it's still a situation that's unravelling, I suppose, and we're examining through the new local plan. Just a final comment. I mean, I, I do think we, are, we, we should be careful about not conflating the two things, care homes and retirement villages. They're two completely different things. And it seems as if in this judgment, the two things are being conflated. Thanks. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Chair. I think I forgot what I was going to ask. <laughs> ah, it was about the park. Um, so, is the park being proposed to be transferred to, I don't know, uh, Parish Council, or who's going to be looking after the park in perpetuity? I know the detail, the maintenance has been secured through the 106 agreement. I can have a quick trawl through that and see. I don't believe it's been transferred to the Parish Council. I believe it's going in with the uh, Gog Magog um, trust that connects as part of that sort of wider network of, of parks. But I can just have a quick look at the 106 if you bear with me. Sure. Okay. I guess my, my concern is that it's it's to be made, it will be maintained and done properly since it's you know one of the key things that is supposed to be a benefit. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think if it assures members certainly that the 106, um, in terms of how the you know, 106 agreements normally cover open space in developments, uh, makes those provisions. There's quite a lengthy 106 agreement that covers in several schedules how the open how the countryside park is to be maintained and delivered. So that is all all secured through the 106 agreement in that respect. Okay, Councillor Fain. Thanks, Chair. Um, just on that point. Uh, I, I think it's right. The um, agreement has been reached with the Magog Trust to manage 170 acres of land which has been restored to um, 
downland, just about 600 yards from the site. Um, and some has been made, I think 350,000, isn't it, has been made available initially for, uh, to ensure sustainable management of the site. Um, just in passing, I was very interested that the inspector agreed with the main uh, point, or for what my mind was the main point, which was um, agreed by this committee when we turned down the application, which was that it was inappropriate development in the, in the green belt, um, which I found rather interesting. Um, another point that he raised was the impact on the CSET busway, which I think he said was years away and could be uh, diverted to another route. Um, now, whether or not he was right on that, clearly it has implications, and I think, um, if I'm right, GCP have, have just put out something to, uh, to Assembly members about the implications of that. Um, my understanding from the developers was that they envisaged that this as a retirement home would be more affordable. Uh, I mean, the, the cost of the care homes in Shelford, there's, there's actually a number of them now, because there's uh, one under development, another one being proposed, and there is, of course, an existing care home there. And the costs of those are eye-wateringly expensive, if I can use an untechnical term. Um, but, of course, it's all very well to say this will be more affordable because the land price is much lower. What I'm not quite sure of is what assurances can be sought. Clearly, that is in a Section 106, I guess. How can we ensure that it is, in the end, more affordable? Um, when the specialist developers have, have been in, will they just seek the market rates? Um, and certainly, you know, my experience in the village and from the housing needs survey is that there is definitely a need for retirement homes, affordable retirement housing in the village. There is one, um, but it's, you know, 350,000 for a two bedroom uh, chalet at the moment. Um, and so apart from the, the new development, the almshouses being put up by the parochial charity that we approved on this committee some time ago, I would say there is clearly a shortage locally, regardless of what the district position is, which I think was agreed. Um, so sorry, not a question, but come on, if you forgive me. Okay, yeah, yeah just an observation there, I think. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Khan, please. Just a reminder, I, I, I have um, a handicapped son who's got cerebral palsy um, he, in his mid-40s, so he's below the age that you're considering, and he's in special care, special accommodation in, in Swansea in South Wales, and he, he lives in a a normal house on a residential estate, four-bedroom house, uh, with, with, with carers coming in uh, all the time, and he's very happy there. Though he's suffered rather during uh, COVID because of isolation. But um, not all people want to go to a care home and can still have care accommodation. I think we should remember that. Um, not everybody wants to be institutionalised or in a large institution, uh, and it will be interesting. I think it's important for us to find information about how much of that provision and that sort of provision there is in the, in the area and how much might be available and how much is suitable. Um, uh, uh, because it's, one shouldn't assume that everybody wants to live in an you know, uh, institutional association, uh, accommodation. No, I do accept that there will be people who do want that. Okay, thank you for those comments. Councillor Ellington, please. I think probably I'm the only person here who knows anything about this. I inspected nursing homes for over 20 years and worked for the police on quite a number of occasions. Um, I would ask whether anybody has asked the Care Quality Commission whether it's feasible, reasonable, or sensible to uh, staff a 110 uh, bedded nursing home, takes significant numbers of staff, and on that hangs the quality of care that they receive. And um, I agree entirely with uh, Martin in that putting an age limit on these things is not what it's about. It is about providing the right sort of care in the right sort of places. And indeed, if you're going to produce a, a village of this nature, have you got enough GPs? Yes. Are they going to be uh, responsible? The people who are in the village who need nursing care in any respect have to be cared for by nursing practitioners from the community nursing service. They are not paid for by the homeowners. And therefore, there's a whole load of things 
that need to be in place long before you start building a building. I shall shut up. Okay, no, thank you for those comments there. Really useful. Um, members, I think that's all we have on that, so unless there's anything more officers wish to add? No? Anything else? Sorry, Councillor Hawkins, please. Um, thank you, Chair, for letting me come back. There's one thing that um, I think might also be affected by this, um, and maybe <coughs> Councillor Fain might have heard uh, some grumblings, which is the the site 400 homes proposed in the first proposals due to the CSET or potential change to CSET. Have you heard anything about that? Or do we know if there's going to be any effect on that? Nope. I think we would have to take that away and talk to our colleagues in policy about that. So. Councillor Fain? I wasn't sure if that was to some extent a question for, for me, Chair. Um, I, I don't know whether it's relevant here, but um, the, as local members, we have suggested that the since four, three to four hectares of development, C2 development, has been proposed here, uh, that might take the place of the three to four hectares of, that is 100 houses, of C3 development, which is included in the local plan, first proposals. Um, but it's just a, a suggestion that has no status, clearly. Um, yeah, and I think we might be, well, officers going to take that away and discuss with colleagues in the policy team, so hope you will hear back. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, uh, Councillor Butcher. Thank you, Chairman. Just a very quick thought, really, here. Um, given the, the comments that the inspector has made about our shortfall of this, um, I think we need to be doing some homework now and... and Picking up from what Councillor Ellington has said and her experiences, I think we need, because I can see us actually um, finding that this has set a precedent. I'm not really quite sure how much of uh, this is going to be guaranteed for retirement home, etc., etc. Because when you read about you know, swimming pools, um, sauna places, beauty vet parlours, cafe, uh, it seems to me like a rather quite expensive holiday camp. Um, and I could see uh, other developers suddenly deciding that some of the things that we wouldn't go along with, we may, they may be able to get around the circumvent the system here. So I think we need to have officers go away and, if necessary, bring expertise in on this sort of thing. Because certainly I know I have... Um, for the last couple of years since COVID, I have um, a, a very elderly lady in that I am now seeing every two or three days I go and to check her out in my village. Um, and she's housebound, but the last thing in the world she wants to do is going to any sort of residential care. But we are having problems. We've got a very good um, private system who are doing her caring, but they are under such huge pressure so i think i'd like us to um do some actual um pretty intensive work on what the need is in the district um and what type of need because taken from what martin said you know i think some of the one house systems are actually really good because they make people part of a community rather than just a set of disabled or elderly or special needs what have you? I'm a great believer in that we shouldn't be passing people uh, off. They should be part of a community. So I just hope maybe we just think a little bit further on this one now. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I think officers have, have taken that note down. Okay. Okay. Councillor Wilson. I, I just wanted to respond to Councillor Hawkins about the CSET. Um, I, I, I'm on the um, Greater Cambridge Partnership Joint Assembly, and I have received um, um, information from the Chief Executive saying that they're now looking again at the proposal contained in the Inspector's um, Appeal Report that envisages a, an alternative route, so they're, they're, they are looking at that, so that's something that's coming along. Great, thank you. Okay, members, I think that's all. 
um, for today. Uh, I'd like to thank all the officers, appreciate many of them have left now, but uh, thank you to the officers in the chamber, especially Michael, who's had a hat trick of applications that he's presented to us and uh, fielded questions on. So I thank him for coming in. Um, members, our next official meeting is the 9th of March, but of course we do have a special meeting to discuss the deferred North Stowe Phase 3B application from the last meeting. And that is on Monday, the 28th of this month, so in a few weeks' time. So, members, if you can't make that date, please do try and arrange a sub sooner rather than later, because it's quite a hefty uh, set of papers to get through. So, um, yeah, just a reminder for members on that. Um, Chair, I think Julie Ayre is still on. Julie, are you with us still? Oh. I know Julie is in the building, so she may not be at her computer. Um, Ju yeah. <laughs> Julie, if you're listening, you're welcome to say uh, a few words now, given it's your last committee. Chair, if, if I may, Julie is just making her way into the chamber now. Okay, so members, if you don't mind indulging us five more minutes, I think we can, we can give Julie five minutes at the very least. So we're going to cut the live stream then, members, just to make you aware. Thank you, everyone.